This is CNN. These are live pictures of the Iraqi capital where the clock has now struck four. Meaning the deadline for President Saddam Hussein to leave has passed. And now Iraqi forces loyal to Mr. Hussein face down a massive U.S.-led force numbering more than 250,000. The U.S.-imposed deadline for Iraqi President Saddam Hussein to go into exile has just expired. It would seem the war is now inevitable. CNN's John Bors is following events in Kuwait, which neighbours Iraq. He joins us now from Kuwait City. John, give us a sense of the mood there. Yeah, hello, Stan. You're here in Kuwait. Certainly apprehension now that that deadline has come and passed, waiting and watching to see, firstly, what the United States and the British forces will do, and secondly, more importantly, perhaps, what Iraq may do. There is a sense here in this tiny country that it may, in fact, be the target of Saddam Hussein's wrath if, in fact, this military campaign goes ahead, as it certainly looks like it will any hour from now. Now, hours before this deadline came and went, there were reported skirmishes already. U.S. officials say at least 10 Iraqi sites were hit uh, from the air in the uh, no southern fly zone. Uh, those targets were deemed to be threats to U.S. forces. The U.S. military uh, planes dropped more than 2 million leaflets over the no southern fly zone, encouraging Iraqis to surrender and also informing civilians that they will not be harmed in any military campaign. Looks as if those leaflets may in fact be having an effect because already 17 Iraqis have surrendered. They surrendered uh, earlier to Kuwaiti uh, forces on the border there. Those 17 Iraqis were uh, patrolling the border when they gave themselves up. Right now they're in the custody of the Kuwaiti police at an undisclosed location. And when this ground war does in fact begin, the Pentagon is expecting to take thousands of POWs, much like they did during the first Gulf War. Word of this surrender quickly spread among the troops who are massed in the desert to the north of Kuwait City. It was greeted with a great deal of enthusiasm. There were many, many cheers of delight about the uh, first Iraqis surrendering. All this as Allied tanks and troops and other vehicles continue to move towards the border. There's been a dramatic increase in traffic along that major road over the last 36 hours. Now, Kuwaiti officials have closed off about 60% of the country to the north. There are checkpoints and roadblocks in place. They're stopping even farmers from returning to their homes, although most, to be fair, have already left. In the desert, troops are breaking camp. They are now ready for the start of this war, which could be any hour now, any day. The U.S. President, George W. Bush, did say that this war would start at a time of his own choosing. Okay, we want to now go uh, to uh, CNN's Brent Sadler, who is uh, on the Kurdish front lines in northern Iraq for an update of the situation there. Brent, what's happening from your position? John, as you say, the deadline has just passed, and here uh, we're about, uh, I don't want to say precisely where we are for obvious reasons, but we're at the outer edge of the Kurdish front lines. This road that you can see behind me is one of the main, if not the main road to Kirkuk, the oil city, which is about a half hour's drive from here, about uh, 40 miles. And this is a road that's going to see for sure a lot of activity once this invasion gets underway. This is a road that's been the main entrance into Erbil in the Kurdish enclave for the past many weeks. We've seen many Iraqi Kurds leaving Kirkuk using this road, but as you can see, here now in the middle of the night here, dead silence. There are many Peshmerga Kurdish guerrilla fighters around this area here. Uh, I've been speaking to them just before coming on air, and they say they're not afraid this evening. They say, in fact, they're looking forward to the start of the U.S.-led invasion because they believe that will lead to the end of Saddam Hussein's rule. They've been listening to radios here. They do know on this Kurdish front line about those surrenders those 17 Iraqi soldiers, which the U.S. is reporting, have given up their position, have walked across the Allied lines, and the Kurds here saying that gives them uh, very good news, they're saying here. Now, also in this area, there are really concerns about the possibility of chemical weapons. We've seen over the past few days tens of thousands of Kurds leaving the main population centers, going into the countryside to get into a safer area. We have just seen... About five minutes ago, we spotted through one of our night scope lenses what seemed to be aircraft activity. We also heard something in the skies above, but as yet no uh, activity in terms of explosions or anything that would signal any sort of attack taking place 
just south of where I am in Saddam Hussein's controlled territory. So just to wrap up, John, behind me here, this road, deadly quiet now, very eerie standing here, just as I say, about three miles from those Iraqi lines, really within a mortar range of their positions. This position is known very well to the Iraqis, so I don't expect we'll be staying here all night, uh, but we'll be watching from a reasonably safe distance as things go on. Back to you, John. Brent, while you're there, um, a lot has been made about Saddam Hussein's chemical weapons, preparations here in Kuwait as well as Israel, other countries. What can the Kurds actually do to prepare for a chemical attack? Well, precious little really, John, uh, looking around the Peshmerga fighters here. They've got no chemical weapon defences whatsoever, no gas masks, no chemical suits. You know, we're far better equipped than they are. We have all that gear stacked in our cars just at the side of the road here. Um, what you see is really just a bunch of, of Peshmerga fighters with their AK-47 rifles. No heavy armor here. No real great expectation that they expect to see a fight here. It's really the population, the civilian population that's taken fright because they really have no serious protection if you look at what's been happening over the past few weeks in places like Kuwait and Israel, John. CNN's Brent Sadler reporting for us there from uh, northern Iraq. Thank you, Brent. Well, here in Kuwait, there certainly is uh, a sense that war is now upon this country. At the airport tonight, chaotic scenes as thousands try to scramble onto uh, the last flights out. The airport was jammed wall to wall with people as many airlines scale back services, not just to Kuwait, but also around the region. British Airways has now suspended flights. Thai Airways will suspend flights later today. Kuwait Air is making arrangements to shift its operations to Dubai. We have not seen these scenes uh, at the airport until tonight. It had been fairly orderly, fairly calm as people made their way out of the country. But certainly tonight, thousands trying to get out on those last flights. And for those who are staying behind, a last-minute shopping frenzy buying up everything which they think that they may need, food, water, batteries very very busy at supermarkets around Kuwait City people stocking up in fact many people though have in fact created panic rooms in their houses taping up windows with plastic and duct tape although interestingly though a lot of people do not have gas masks the government here only bought about 200,000 gas masks enough for only 10 percent of the population and a great deal of criticism about that here in Kuwait they point to a country like Israel where six million gas masks have been handed out, but certainly people are now ready for war, ready for what may come next. Stan? John, thank you very much for that. John Vaughan coming to us from Kuwait City. Obviously a very anxious time there. The threat alert very high. John, we'll touch in with you again a little bit later during the program. U.S. commanders say they're hoping for a quick campaign, winning a war with Iraq in a matter of days. Let's turn now to Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon as Washington prepares its military campaign. Jamie? And even though the war hasn't started yet, there's still been military activity, including stepped-up strikes in the no-fly zones and even what appears to be the first Iraqi surrenders. For now, it's not a question of if the U.S. attack, but a question of when. Swirling sandstorms in southern Iraq is one factor, sources say, could prompt U.S. commanders to wait at least another day before launching the invasion northward. Even before the deadline expired, U.S. jets on no-fly zone patrol struck multiple targets in the south, including 10 Iraqi artillery pieces on the al Faw Peninsula capable of firing chemical shells, and a surface-to-surface -surface missile launcher around the Basra area. Both were in range of the 130,000 U.S. troops massing along the Iraqi border. Unlike in 1991, the U.S. already has air superiority over most of Iraq even before the war starts. Uh, we are starting off in a significantly better s position as a consequence of the northern and southern no-fly zones, which will enable operations that might not otherwise have been able to commence. Pentagon sources say more airstrikes will be conducted overnight to prepare the battlefield, and U.S. troops may move into the demilitarized zone between Kuwait and Iraq in the next 24 hours. The idea is to break the Iraqi will with a show of force and a barrage of several million leaflets dropped in recent days. 
the effects that we are trying to create is to make it so apparent and so overwhelming at the very outset of potential military operations that the adversary quickly realizes that, that there is no real alternative here other than to, to fight and die or to give up. The front of the leaflets have the text, to avoid destruction, follow coalition guidelines, and show that Iraqi troops should stay at least a kilometer away from their vehicles. The back says to park the vehicles in squares no larger than battalion size, to stow artillery and air defense systems in a travel configuration, and to display white flags on the vehicles. There's a warning against displaying portable air defense systems. Officers are told they can retain their sidearms, but others must disarm. Do not approach coalition forces, the leaflet says. Wait for further instructions. Already some 17 Iraqi troops who are apparently part of the border patrol have surrendered to U.S. military forces crossing the border into Kuwait. They've been turned over to Kuwaiti authorities. The U.S. military is hoping that it's the beginning of what will eventually be a flood of Iraqi troop surrenders. Leon? All right, Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon. Thank you. We're going to now take you back to Baghdad. We've been showing you live pictures coming from there throughout the morning, um, the early morning stages of Iraq. We'll try to get those pictures for you now. There we go in Baghdad at the moment. Of course, that deadline has now passed. It is past 4 a.m. in Baghdad. It is now 4.11 in Baghdad at the moment. That's 11 minutes past the deadline that was set for Saddam Hussein to go into exile or face an attack from the U.S. And the U.S.-led invasion forces are now getting into formation around the border regions surrounding Iraq. And, of course, we did have that news with Jamie just reported of 17 Iraqi soldiers who have already surrendered to the U.S. military. Well, Iraq insists there is no chance Iraqi President Saddam Hussein will opt for exile. If Mr. Hussein stays, how will his army fight a war against vastly superior forces? David Ensor asks the experts. Will Saddam Hussein fight at the border or pull back to fight in the streets of Baghdad? Will he try to survive or attack with chemical weapons and try to go down as an Arab martyr? Only he knows for sure. But former CIA analyst Judy Yaffe says one way or another, the man she's analyzed for so many years will try to kill a lot of Americans. I think his theory is I will do as much as I can to make it as ugly as possible for the Americans. I still believe that they have a Vietnam syndrome lingering, that once they see body bags, because they will, this is not Kuwait, this is Iraq, this is Baghdad, we Iraqis know how to fight in the streets, those Americans can't handle this. Military analysts say the Iraqi leader may order dams breached to flood the Tigris and Euphrates river plains. Some believe he may force thousands of Iraqi civilians, women and children out onto the roads creating a human buffer between the Americans and his forces. And then wait for U.S. troops in the streets of Baghdad and surrounding villages. I think what is of most concern to commanders, though, is the hunkering down in the villages and neighborhoods themselves that will force house-to-house -house fighting. And the goal, the strategy he seems to be pursuing is that he is going to create this fortress Baghdad, what I keep calling the Mesopotamian Stalingrad. Then, if the end appears near, military analysts fear Saddam Hussein may order the use of the very weapons of mass destruction he insists he does not have. My instinct is if he decides to use chemical weapons, it will be in a last case Armageddon scenario. The analysts we spoke to agreed on this. There are likely to be some surprises for American troops as well as for the Iraqis. David Ensor, CNN Washington. The deadline U.S. President George W. Bush issued to Iraqi President Saddam Hussein to go into voluntary exile expired a short while ago. Mr. Bush had threatened military action if the Iraqi leader failed to comply. Now that Mr. Hussein has apparently rejected the ultimatum, White House correspondent Suzanne Malvo joins us with this update from Washington. Suzanne? Well, it's really been an extraordinary day for the president and, quite frankly, for everyone as we've engaged in this countdown to the ultimatum deadline and now simply waiting for war. White House aides saying that it could come at any time when the military commanders recommend him that now is the ultimate time to go, and he'll say go. Time up for Saddam Hussein, a U.S. strike against Iraq, all but certain. The president made very plain to the American people that as a result of Saddam Hussein's failure to disarm and his possession of weapons of mass destruction, he has come to the determination that the only way to enforce the United Nations resolutions now is through the use of force.
when to use military force was the focus of President Bush's meetings with his top Pentagon brass. He was briefed on conditions in the region, including weather and troop movements that would help determine the best time to go in. Mr. Bush was also briefed by his Secretary of Homeland Security, Tom Ridge, and New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg about the increased risk of terrorist attacks on American soil and New York's special needs. As required, the president officially notified Congress that all diplomatic means to disarm Iraq had been exhausted. In a letter, he said, further diplomatic and other peaceful means alone will neither adequately protect the national security of the United States against the continuing threat posed by Iraq, nor likely lead to enforcement of all relevant United Nations Security Council resolutions regarding Iraq. Aides say Mr. Bush hopes for a precise and quick victory. White House spokesman Ari Fleischer says the president believes the American people are ready for war, have even accepted the reality that lives will be lost. Leanne. Certainly very tense moments. Suzanne Malveaux at the White House. Thank you. And of course, as we've been reporting, the uh, deadline has now passed for Iraqi President Saddam Hussein to leave Iraq. That deadline, of course, set by U.S. President George W. Bush. Now Iraq is facing a U.S.-led force to attack Iraq. When we go now to Nick Robertson, who's standing by in Baghdad with the latest from there. Nick? In Baghdad, barely a car out on the street. It's a bright moon over the city tonight. The city is very bright. The lights are on. Uh, if there was, uh, if there had been traffic out, you might think that there was nothing wrong with the city at all. But it is unusually, uncharacteristically still. The people uh, we've seen going about their business earlier in the day, very few of them out on the streets, much less traffic during the day, and a huge air of apprehension, fear. Um, hanging over this city at this time. We've heard, of course, from the politicians today, from uh, Deputy Prime Minister Tariq Aziz, at one, po at one moment in the day, rumours sweeping the region that he had either been injured or he had defected, left the country. Uh, within an hour of those reports being on international television, he appeared, said that there was, it was a psychological warfare campaign that was going on, um, that one should not believe the rumours, that there would be more rumours. We also heard earlier in the day from Information Minister Mohammed al Sahaf essentially saying the same thing, that this is a psychological war, that the uh, U.S. and British and coalition troops were being misinformed by their leaders. They were being lied to, that any invasion of Iraq would not be easy, would not be a picnic, they said, and that the forces would meet difficulties. They should come in with their eyes open, he said. Stan. Nick, a lot of speculation that Baghdad itself is going to become a fortress, that there is going to be a siege of Baghdad, they're going to for force the U.S. troops to fight them on the streets of Baghdad. Any indication of preparations for that at all? Around the city, Stan, um, very, very difficult to say that, uh, to see, one doesn't see big fortifications around the city, one sees small sandbag place emplacements around some of the government buildings, um, and these sorts of things, not, uh, one doesn't get the impression of the city being a fortress. However, um, we have seen on the television here, and it has been talked about by President Saddam Hussein with his military commanders, they've talked about urban warfare. We've seen pictures of soldiers on the television training for urban warfare. The word from President Saddam Hussein to his commanders is, you, you should minimize your losses and maxif maximize the losses of, the, of your enemy. Save your bullets. Um, for your enemy when you're sure that you can kill them. The instructions appear to fit in with that, with that image of, of an urban war battlefield. And certainly the defense of the city, the, con the consecutive lines of defense that, uh, that the uh, uh, president has talked about here in the past all add up to that. But the city does not seem like a fortress. It is not, if you will, crawling with soldiers. It is not in place with huge, uh, huge military bunkers. There are a few, full, few small sandbag bunkers around the city. That's all we see. That's the only visible sign stand. What about a sense of anticipation, a sense of fear amongst the ordinary Iraqi people themselves? What have you picked up, Nick? This is a city of five million people. The vast majority here cannot afford to leave the city. Some people, if they've had a little extra money, they have left, perhaps taken their families out of the country. That is a minority. Others, if they've got relatives in the countryside, have sent families out there. But the vast majority of people are staying here. They don't really know where they can go or what they can do to be safe. There's a huge fear of 
what could happen during the bombing, a fear of, of, of collateral damage, a fear of how they're going to feed their families. On top of that, there's a fear that this may be a destabilizing influence, that there may be a period where there is no strong power in the city, that there would be civil disorder. They're afraid perhaps of looting. They're afraid um, perhaps in, the, in, the, in Iraq's history, people are very aware of when there have been uh, uh, revolts and armed uprisings, they've been very bloody. A lot of revenge has been taken, so people are very concerned about that. With all this fear, though, there is a degree of anger. People say, and privately, even if we want to change the leadership of Iraq, we don't want to do it by an invading force. This is not the way. People fear the instability that it could bring, and they're also opposed to the notion of having a coalition of United States and Great Britain invading Iraq. Stan? Nick, can I just clarify, you, you Nick, spoke there clarify. about some people moving out of the city. How much movement have you seen? It's not a heavy movement uh, by any stretch of the imagination. We've seen the occasional car go by um, with, with, that's been full of people and their possessions. We know that prices have gone up um, for taxes to take people out of the city. We know that um, the buses taking people out of the city have been full at times. But as I, this is a city of five million people. Most people here, for example, uh, a teacher would perhaps earn five U.S. dollars a month here. It's not enough money over a period of time for somebody to be able to run a car, fill it with fuel, have somewhere where they could take their family. The reason that most people here cannot flee the city or flee their immediate environment is after 12 years of sanctions, the economy has been severely damaged. And that has had a huge economic impact across a broad swath of the population here. And that's why we're not seeing huge numbers escaping. A lot, a lot, many people have gone, but not huge numbers. The majority, as far as we know, as far as we understand, remain in the city. Nick, thank you very much for that. Nick Robertson, there, our much. senior international correspondent, joining us from Baghdad, where it is now 4.21 a.m. That shot coming to you live from Baghdad. Well, pilots and sailors throughout the region are waiting for their orders to act. Let's go to Gary Stryker now. He's aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt. Gary, what's going on right now where you are? Well, the, uh, the Roosevelt is in the eastern Mediterranean, along with another uh, carrier from the United States, and uh, there are actually five U.S. carriers in the region. Uh, we just had a briefing uh, shortly, uh, not, not too long ago, by the public affairs people here who told us that the, uh, the people on this carrier are in standby mode. We haven't been able to see any unusual activity. There's the um, ordinary uh, type of um, uh, launches and then recoveries of aircraft on the flight deck. There's uh, practice missions that are taking place all the time. We haven't seen any uh, unusual amount of live ordnance being loaded onto planes. Uh, basically, uh, the situation here on the carrier is that they're in standby mode and they're waiting for orders that would change the situation dramatically. They can uh, switch immediately to a wartime mode. Thing. Gary, tell us what the role of the Roosevelt is going to be. What sort of a, a strategic uh, role will they play in any attack? Well. The, um, the first strikes in the war are expected to be carried out by Tomahawk cruise missiles fired from destroyers and cruisers. In the Persian Gulf, uh, vessels are like that are there, also in the Red Sea. And here in the Mediterranean, there are two carrier groups that include uh, two destroyers and two cruisers. They are, they're loaded with uh, Tomahawks, and they're expected to participate in the first strikes. And uh, they're within range of, uh, of targets in Iraq, out here in the Mediterranean. And uh, the, the carriers, including the Roosevelt, would uh, follow very quickly after the Tomahawk strikes with uh, airstrikes. Fighter jets from the carriers on bombing missions uh, taking off. Uh, these are uh, Hornets and, and Tomcats. Uh, we, we just went down into the, the magazine of this uh, aircraft carrier and saw some of the ordnance, the bombs down there that they have stored to be loaded onto these planes, and it is an impressive sight. I can tell you there are hundreds of thousand-pound bombs that are being assembled on a regular basis down there. This uh, carrier uh, is loaded and ready to go, Stan. Gary, you get to speak to those on board. This, of course, has been a, a steady build-up for some time now. What is the mood amongst those on board? 
everybody you talk to here has virtually the same response that they've trained for this they're ready for it uh they're they're relieved in a way that finally a decision has been made and that something is going to be done about this the carrier has been circling around in a coordinate box in, in the eastern mediterranean for uh, a couple weeks and uh, the tedium has kind of grown people have wanted to get something done and now they they feel that Okay, they've made a decision. Now we're going to get uh, we're going to get moving. But there's still uh, some anxiety. Uh, people have have told us that it, it um, there's, there's nervous anxiety among the crew. They're uh, they're anxious. Uh, anxiety level is up a little bit. You hear people constantly using the term anxious anxiety. Uh, many of these people have never been in combat before. There are of course many veterans from the uh, from the campaign uh, in Afghanistan. They saw action there. The Roosevelt was in the um, in the Indian Ocean off Pakistan, and, and many of the aircraft uh, on the Roosevelt went into uh, Afghanistan on bombing missions. But uh, everyone is um, is is primed, as they say. They're they're ready to move whenever they're given the the order, and the morale you know, generally is very high here. Stan. Gary, thank you. Gary Stryker there on board the USS Theodore Roosevelt. And we'll be checking in with our correspondents around the Gulf again. First, though, we are going to take a break. It's now about 20 minutes past four in the morning in Baghdad. We'll be back in just a moment. sports fan then get into this here we go foxtel sports plus package three big sports channels unbeatable action unbeatable value get one get them all go! fox footy channel your team every game every week unrivaled access to the biggest names in the game yeah now superstars there isn't there sports plus packed with extras fox footy extra a brand new channel dedicated to your club your state and he gets it from the national to the international sports plus also delivers espn the worldwide leader in sports home of the nhl and nba playoffs the uefa champions league Explosive X Games, golf, tennis, motorsport, and Major League Baseball. Get on a winner. Fox Footy Channel, Fox Footy Extra, and ESPN. Foxtel Sports Plus Package. Call now and get it on and get serious about your sport today. Welcome back. As a U.S.-led invasion force now awaits the order to unleash a massive strike on Iraq, we take another live shot from Baghdad, where it is 4.28 a.m., almost half an hour past the deadline for Saddam Hussein to go into exile and leave Iraq. Well, as we mentioned, the deadline has passed. There is no indication that President Hussein will actually leave Iraq. The world is now waiting to see if and when the U.S. and British forces might launch that strike. CNN's John Vores is following events in Kuwait, which neighbours Iraq. He joins us now from Kuwait City. John? Yeah, hi Stan. One of the factors which could determine when those uh, US and British and Australian forces go into Baghdad is of course the phases of the moon. Right now here in the skies over Kuwait and Iraq there is a full moon. It is a very bright night here and that is not considered ideal for coalition forces. The US claims to own the night. They would prefer to have no moon at all because of its superiority with night vision goggles and night vision technology. So they could in fact be waiting a number of days before there is a, a new moon or no moon in the sky. So that's one of the factors which could determine when those forces go into Iraq. Meantime, CNN's Carl Penhall is with the US Army's 11th Attack Helicopter Regiment. He is embedded with that uh, Corps and he filed this report from Northern Kuwait. 
The only thing flying here is the stars and stripes. As a sandstorm whips across the Kuwaiti desert, US Army attack helicopters are grounded. A precautionary measure to reduce maintenance. But three-star general William Wallace warns the soldiers and pilots under his command they'll see action soon enough. The ultimatum given is, uh, is complete. Although I know that no soldier ever really wants to go to war, we are left with uh, no alternative. As the clock ticks down to President Bush's 48-hour deadline, the soldiers of 1st Attack Battalion draw their ammunition. When the order comes, these troops will set off across the border into Iraq. The pilots, meanwhile, will fly into combat against Iraqi tanks and artillery. As preparations pick up, an unannounced chemical attack drill adds extra urgency and rattles some nerves. We locked in the tent, we sailed it. The all clear comes 20 minutes later. Time enough for a sobering lesson about the dangers that may lie ahead. Commanders have been briefing their soldiers exactly when they'll be heading to war. Should Iraqi President Saddam Hussein fail to meet President Bush's ultimatum to quit. Time and place classified. We are first attack. All they're waiting for is General Wallace to give them the order to roll. Are you ready? No! From where I'm standing, American soldiers and their aircraft can be inside Iraq within minutes. Those same soldiers are only now beginning to wonder how long they'll end up staying. Carl Penhall for CNN in northern Kuwait. With the deadline now passed and with so many troops now on the border between Iraq and Kuwait, many spent the day praying, others made their calls home. It could be the last time. They get to speak to their family and friends in the United States and in Britain and Australia. Could be their last chance for quite some time. Stan? John, what about expatriates trying to actually leave Kuwait? How successful have they been in trying to get out? Well, of course, there's been chaos here tonight over the last couple of hours at the airport in Kuwait City. Thousands of people jamming into Kuwait's airport. Now, it's a medium-sized airport, and by all accounts, it should be able to handle uh, a busy day, but... It probably hasn't seen anything like this before. Extremely busy. People wall-to-wall -wall jammed trying to get out. A number of airlines have, in fact, cancelled flights. And uh, so the demand uh, tonight was extremely great, greater than many people, in fact, predicted. Also, Kuwaitis uh, stocking up on everything which they may need should uh, this war turn towards Kuwait, should there, in fact, be an attack on Kuwait. And that's the biggest fear here, is that Saddam Hussein, who fears he now has nothing else to lose, he could, in fact, launch an attack some kind of scud attack or chemical attack on this small country, Stan. John, thank you. John Vaughan joining us here from Kuwait City. Hundreds of anti-war protesters have come out in force in Los Angeles, some banging drums, others chanting slogans. A similar demonstration is taking place up the California coast in San Francisco. A man who may have been protesting a war in Iraq leaped to his death from the Golden Gate Bridge. The anti-war sentiment comes as the U.S. makes security preparations during hostilities in the Middle East. We're joined now by Chicago Bureau Chief Jeff Flock, who is at the Sears Tower, the tallest building in the U.S following the terror attacks of September 11th. Certainly stepped up security where you are. Indeed, all across the U.S. tonight, Leanne, uh, precautions being taken, particularly at perceived targets. As you point out, we are at the Sears Tower, tallest building in the U.S. tonight. Uh, many people have been afraid, particularly since 9-11, that perhaps this building would, uh, would uh, uh, come under a similar attack. In fact, some people that work tall in this tower have gone so far as to purchase parachutes so that if uh, they were unable to get out any other way, they could perhaps get out that way. We've got pictures of this tower in the daylight. We can tell you what they've done is erected uh, cement barricades, red, white, and blue ones, uh, that would uh, preclude uh, bomb-laden vehicles from perhaps being driven too close to the building. In addition, all of the shipments inside the Sears Tower are now x-rayed. Anyone that walks into the Sears Tower goes through a magnetometer and they say they say if uh, it goes to a code red in the u.s uh, a danger level code red they would shut down the popular sky deck where folks can go up and take a look out over the city other precautions at the world's busiest airport that's o'hare airport here in chicago uh, all folks that uh, come to the airport are tonight being greeted by a sign flashing which uh, informs them that they are subject to a random search in fact we saw chicago police officers pull many vehicles over four random searches out there. In addition, there are canine patrols. 
uh, stepped up security at the airport as well, including, we are uh, being told tonight, uh, uh, police officers being dispatched to uh, streets uh, beneath flight paths of airplanes so as to head off anyone who might be uh, having a, a shoulder-launched missile. Uh, so serious precautions all across the U.S., particularly here in Chicago where we stand tonight. Leanne, back to you. Jeff, you mentioned uh, people buying parachutes uh, amidst the stepped-up uh, security. Are people preparing for chemical attacks as well? Some people have gone so far as to uh, purchase uh, gas masks. Uh, uh, the city has tried to get uh, the word out that it has a plan uh, to give folks uh, uh, some uh, uh, information about what to do in this sense of, in the case of a chemical attack, to check the wind, the, the basics that, that many of us have learned. Uh, the city feels it is as prepared as it can be right now. And what will it uh, be like when uh, morning actually comes? Are people still going to work? Is it still going to be business as usual? Are schools going to be closed? It, no, no, indeed, they will not be. It was a normal day out at the airport. We spent much of the day at O'Hare Airport. It looked like a very normal day today. Only cancellations were flights to Denver here in the U.S., which uh, was under a, a massive snowstorm. So pretty much a normal day at O'Hare, a normal day in Chicago. And no one here is expecting to alter their routine even after hostilities commence. You mentioned, Jeff, of course, uh, war protesters taking to the streets in L.A., in New York, in Washington. How manageable was that for the security forces? Certainly a very tough job here as they try to juggle the threat of terrorism and, of course, now these war demonstrations, anti-war demonstrations. Indeed, the plan is here in Chicago, as is in many cities, for 5 o'clock on the day in the afternoon after hostilities commence that uh, folks gather. Here it will be on the Federal Plaza, not too many blocks from where I stand back there behind me in the darkness. Uh, a, a group will come uh, prearranged to that location to demonstrate. Uh, local authorities are prepared for that. They know it's coming, and they're ready for it. All right, and that was Jeff Flock, a CNN correspondent in Chicago. Thank you very much. And once again, we bring you live pictures from Baghdad. Currently, it's 4.36 a.m. in Baghdad. The deadline for Saddam Hussein to leave the country and uh, voluntarily give up power has already expired. So far, no sign of any military action on either front. The U.S. has come out again to say, the White House at least, that the attack will come at a time of the U.S.'s choosing. Preparations for an imminent war in Iraq are not limited to the immediate region. Israeli leaders say they are 100% ready for the possibility that Iraq will respond to a U.S. invasion by attacking Israel. Kelly Wallace has more. In Tel Aviv, stormy seas outside. But even with an Iraqi war possibly just hours away, a sense of calm inside. I don't uh, put the plastic on the on the window, on the window, nothing. Not really. Like like now, like before the the war. It's business as usual for Avraham and his pals, all retired, who have been getting together every day for coffee for three years. However, Moshe admits he's slightly worried. I lived through all the wars in Israel, he tells us. He who is not worried is no hero. In a sign of the country's stepped-up preparations, late Wednesday, the Israeli military instructed citizens to open up their gas mask kits and carry their gas masks with them at all times beginning Thursday, with instructions provided on public television. Earlier, Prime Minister Ariel Sharon tried to reassure the public. Uh, the danger that Israel will get hit is very small, Sharon said at a cabinet meeting. Israel is 100 percent prepared. Even though the Tel Aviv area bore the brunt of the Iraqi Scud attacks in 1991, most people here don't believe it will be the same this time. Still, they're taking precautions. I'm not scared, but I'm not stupid, you know. <laughs> so somewhere in between. In between picking up groceries, some Israelis pick up duct tape and plastic to prepare a sealed-off room in the event of any fallout from the war. 
Alina, who works as a nurse, says she's convinced Iraq will fire a missile at Israel. Because Saddam Hussein will do anything to defend himself, she tells us. But Sarah, a teacher and a mother of four, has so far made no preparations. Maybe something is wrong with me, but I'm not too scared. Like most Israelis, 30-year-old Inbal says she is ready for whatever happens. Mentally, I mean, we're more prepared because it happened. Once it happened one time, you know, it's been there, done that, so okay. Despite the turbulent times, the mood here relaxed but alert. Kelly Wallace, CNN, Tel Aviv. Now, as Washington gears up for a likely military campaign in Iraq, opponents to the U.S.-led invasion are questioning how diplomacy failed at the United Nations. Richard Roth is in New York with an update. Richard? Yes, Stan, it's evening here, and some people who were left in the building at U.N. headquarters uh, watching that deadline, a 48-hour deadline, pass. One journalism colleague of mine a few hours ago strolled out of the building and said, there's nothing left to say here. And that may be true, the final Security Council meeting on Iraq, perhaps, before a potential military conflict. At that meeting, the foreign ministers of France, Germany, and Russia said that any conflict uh, would be not in conformity with the U.N. Charter. The United Nations Security Council has been debating for weeks this issue, and they never really were able to resolve everything. Uh, Chief Weapons Inspector Hans Blix uh, of the United Nations now sits on the sidelines and laments the fact that he wasn't able to complete his work. It's a sad moment, uh, I think. First of all, it's sad because war is, is horrible. And uh, secondly, because I think that we were there for three and a half months and we had better conditions for inspection than UNSCOM ever did. The Iraqis, after all, allowed us to get in everywhere. We were also fully occupied with destroying a lot of missiles that we had judged were violated the, the rules. Uh, so I think we were moving. And uh, then, of course, it is rather sad uh, to leave after such a short time. The inspector said he has not been asked by the United States to have his inspectors perhaps go in and verify any find, if it is indeed made of weapons of mass destruction, by any military force going into Iraq. The U.S. Ambassador John Negroponte questioned the purpose of the Security Council meeting. It was ostensibly to hear Blix give a final report on what are the remaining disarmament tasks, the main 12 items that Iraq still has to do. Blix said Iraq has still not exactly overwhelmed his inspectors with cooperation. Of course, the inspectors are now outside of the country. The U.S. and the U.K. are now drafting a resolution on the Oil for Food program to adjust it so that perhaps it's the U.N. that now fully runs it, uh, depending on what happens with events on the ground there, in case there's a change in Iraqi administration. Stan. Richard, perhaps it is academic, but there are questions about why this process did fail and the futility of the UN Security Council. Yes, those questions will probably increase as time goes on, but uh, it may depend on the outcome of the war. Uh, the French government and the, uh, the uh, Germans who were here and the Russians uh, were very strong in their criticism that it was a violation of the UN Charter. Russia, though, is quick to say if there is trouble and the U.S. needs assistance, Russia is always there, noting that President Putin was the first world leader to call President Bush after the terrorism attacks of 9-11. They haven't really figured this out yet on healing the wounds. There is, uh, some diplomats say the healing is starting at the ambassadorial level, but Secretary Powell wasn't here. Foreign Secretary Straw of Britain uh, boycotted the meeting. They all felt it wasn't worth a uh, ministerial meeting as called for by France. But a lot of issues have been raised, as you noted, by what happened here in the Council. Can another country attack another, uh, claiming perhaps preemptive self-defense? Uh, they'll be writing about this one for years. Richard, thank you once again. Richard Roth joining us live from the United Nations. Japan is supporting any U.S.-led war against Iraq, but almost 80% of Japanese people are not in favor of a war without U.N. approval. Well, to tell us more, we're joined by Rebecca McKinnon in Tokyo. Rebecca? Well, Leanne, despite the widespread public opposition to this kind of attack against Iraq without U.N. Uh, backing, without a U.N. resolution, the Japanese Prime Minister Junichiro Koizumi m remains steadfastly behind the U.S. effort. He's expected to speak to the nation after the U.S. Oh, attack right. begins, uh, reiterating his support for the attack. And uh, the Japanese government is also working on a package 
of uh, possible measures that would have to be passed in Parliament, possibly a law that would enable Japan's self-defense forces to um, assist in rear support uh, of the United States effort. Now, of course, Japan's pacifist constitution does not allow Japan to send troops to actually engage in battle. Japan's constitution does not allow its uh, military to wage war overseas. So the self-defense forces would be very limited in terms of what they could do uh, to only uh, medical and logistical support far away from the combat. Japan is also expected to uh, support very strongly any humanitarian efforts and also rebuilding of Iraq. Uh, the United States has been uh, praising Japan for its support. The U.S. Ambassador here, Howard Baker, uh, saying that Japan is really one of the United States' best friends in the world, accepting perhaps the United Kig Kingdom. Uh, Leon? All right, Rebecca McKinnon reporting live from Japan there. And we'll take a quick break now. News Business Today will be right back. Stay tuned. wonders and diverse cultures than one could ever discover. Come, experience paradise under the ASEAN skies. India Tourism presents Sights and Sounds of India. Incredible India. Back, the traditional call to prayer echoing out across Baghdad, a very eerie sight at Baghdad. One description I have read says it is swirling dust shrouded in grey clouds and an ominous moon, mood hanging over Baghdad at the moment. Of course, it is now about uh, or almost an hour since the, uh, the uh, deadline for President Saddam Hussein to go into exile, leave Iraq, has passed. The live pictures are coming to you from Baghdad. Now, the U.S. says it is planning for a swift war in Iraq, and over the past weeks, Washington has repeatedly warned Iraq not to resort to chemical or biological weapons. During his Monday night address, President George W. Bush urged the Iraqi military not to destroy Iraq's oil fields. Richard Blystone has this perspective on how Iraq's environment has suffered in recent years. This is where it all began, they say. Villages, towns, cities, plows, writing, war. When they move up into southern Iraq, Allied soldiers will see firsthand what is only a sketchy picture now. Just across the Kuwaiti border, a litter of mines and dud ordnance from the 1991 war. Before pulling out, the German hospital here treated a steady stream of maimed Iraqis. If Iraq tortures its own oil wells, 
Well, here's what it did to Kuwait a dozen years ago. A smoke plume that went all the way to India and a fallout crust of asphalt over big areas of Kuwait. In the southern Iraqi desert, depleted uranium like this. Tons of it from warheads used in desert storm. Not dangerous unless you handle it a lot or breathe its dust. The Fowl Peninsula in far southern Iraq, once a garden, the eight-year Iran-Iraq war turned it into this. And saddest of all, the 10,000 square kilometers, 4,000 square miles of wetlands around Basra. For 5,000 years, they were home to the Madan, or marsh Arabs, and to a wealth of wildlife. Once a quarter of a million marsh dwellers, now around 40,000 after the Baghdad regime drained the marshes and cracked down on those who opposed its rule. These pictures are a decade old. Now what's left will be mostly desert and stinking mud. From environmental point of view, it's Kuwaiti scientist Abdul Nebi Al Ghadban calls it an environmental crime. Destruction can be done in no time, but rehabilitation takes years and years and years to rehabilitate. The red brown mass is the marshes. This is in 1972. It's almost untouched, it's almost clean, crisp. You could see it very easily that it is lively, full of water, and the life is okay. In 1990, the gray of drought is growing. Then, 1997. You can see the, the gray color is almost covering the whole area, which presumably you could say that more than 96% of this area has been drained. But the damage goes farther than that, spreading pollution down the waterways and into the Gulf, where it's wiping out marine life. And that's just part of the scene before another war. At least when it's all over, the scientists can get in and study it. Richard Blystone, CNN Kuwait. The United States' number five air carrier is bracing for the impact of war, calling it one of the worst financial crises in aviation history. Continental Airlines chief executive Gordon Bethune says the carrier will slash 1,200 jobs by the end of the year. Bethune expects to save half a million dollars from the move. But he warns that if the war in Iraq is prolonged, the company will need to find additional ways to save money and generate more revenue. U.S. airlines have lost nearly $20 billion since the end of 2000. The Air Transport Association says the industry could lose an additional $10 billion this year because of the war. European carriers are also scaling back to soften the blow from war. British Airways has halted service to and from Kuwait and Tel Aviv. Dutch carrier KLM has grounded its Friday on Sunday flights to Kuwait. And Swiss International has cut service between Zurich and Cairo by nearly 30% due to lower demand. Here is what Richard Branson, the chairman of UK-based Virgin Atlantic, has to say about the looming war. At the moment we're not cutting capacity, but what we're not doing um, is expanding on some of the new routes that we planned. Um, obviously what we're hoping is that uh, if this war happens and if Saddam Hussein doesn't step down that uh, it, it will be brief. I think that what, you know, one thing that is likely to happen is that fuel, fuel prices are likely to drop um, and, and that will obviously help, help the airline industry in the short term. A trade group representing most of the world's international air carriers has reportedly decided to raise airfares in response to high fuel costs. Reuters Wires Agency quotes sources as saying the International Air Transport Association will hike prices by 3% from April 15th. Japan's top airlines are expected to ask the government for permission to increase fares. Shares of Japan Airlines System and All Nippon Airways are both higher in Tokyo. A number of other Asian airlines have made contingency plans. Singapore Airlines says it will cut its weekly services to Dubai next week due to a drop in passenger bookings. Once the war begins, Korean Air will halt flights to Dubai and Cairo. It will also reduce services to a number of U.S. cities. And Thai Airways says it will stop servicing Kuwait and Bahrain later on Thursday. Now the world is waiting to see if or more likely when U.S. and British forces will strike Iraq. Here are the latest developments in the Iraq crisis. The U.S. imposed deadline for Iraqi President Saddam Hussein to go into exile past almost an hour ago, but there are no signs that any sort of significant attack is underway. Coalition aircraft did strike multiple targets in southern Iraq on Wednesday. Pentagon officials say a total of 17 Iraqi soldiers have already surrendered to U.S. forces. They reportedly are in Kuwaiti custody. And chaos at Kuwait City International Airport prompted officials to close roads into the airport and allow only passengers with tickets into the facility. 
And you're looking once again at live pictures from the Iraqi capital, Baghdad. Our coverage continues here on CNN. It's currently 4.53 a.m. in Baghdad. Stay with us. Taking you around the corporate world live. It's money decisions that turn the world. It's BizAsia's responsibility to ask hard questions. Are you going to cut staff? Are you going to slash costs? Helping you do business in Asia. And why do people watch? It's absolutely fascinating. BizAsia, only on CNN. Welcome back. You are seeing now live pictures coming once again from Baghdad. It's 4.56am, almost one hour since the passage of that deadline. In Kuwait City, expatriates are rushing to the airport to try to get out of the city. As the mood there turns anxious, the threat alert is very high. That's where we join John Vores, who's going to bring us the latest from there. John, about 175,000 US and British troops awaiting their orders. What are the expectations on when that order may come? Well, Stan, one of the factors in any ground or air assault is, of course, the phases of the moon. Right now, over Kuwait and Iraq, there's, in fact, a full moon. That's not ideal for U.S. military forces or British forces. They would prefer to have a new moon or no moon. The darker, the better, because that better suits their night vision goggle capacity. That's the moon. As you can see it, it's a full moon, very, very bright. So we're waiting for those phases of the moon to pass. So that is one factor which could play into all this. It won't be a defining factor, just one of them. An indication that things here in Kuwait City are at least relatively normal. We just heard a short time ago the call to prayer. Uh, it's about 5 a.m. here, so uh, the call to prayer is a sign that things are still normal in anything but a normal situation. As you mentioned, hundreds and hundreds of expats scrambling to leave, scrambling to get out. We heard before from Leanne about a number of airlines which have uh, suspended flights to the region. It's interesting what's happened here over the last 24 hours. Uh, there's been an appre apprehensive mood here and in the last 24 hours it seems to have been ratcheted up quite significantly almost to uh, not quite panic but certainly something very very close to it now that many expats have been advised by their governments and their embassies that it's simply too dangerous to stay here in Kuwait and the biggest fear is that Kuwait, Kuwait could pay a dear dear price for hosting those tens of thousands of coalition forces which are now massed in the deserts to the north. And the fear here is that Saddam Hussein okay. may actually launch some kind of preemptive strike to extract revenge from the people of, of Kuwait for hosting those troops. And that could happen at any time, especially now that we're an hour past the deadline, Stan. 
Indeed, we are one hour past the deadline. Thank you very much for that. John, John Vaughan is joining us from Kuwait City. You've been watching News Biz today. A quick wrap up now of the key developments. The US imposed deadline has passed for Iraqi President Saddam Hussein to go into exile, but there are no signs that an attack on Iraq has begun. The Pentagon says a total of 17 Iraqi soldiers have surrendered to US forces. We now join Larry King live with more coverage of the crisis in Iraq. You get footy 48 hours a day with Fox Footy Channel and Fox Footy Extra. A commitment no other broadcaster in Australia can match. And the crowd rises. Go! The season's about to begin and you can kick off early on Sunday, March 23rd. Oh! Don't go anywhere. Go! Every subscriber will have access to Fox Footy Channel and Fox Footy Extra. Feel the fever for a full week. Get a taste of Australia's ultimate AFL channels. Kick the goal! It's open season with Talkback TV, exclusive interviews, previews and every game of the opening round, uninterrupted, siren to siren. Welcome back. You can never get enough footy. Game on. It's also your chance to kick on with us and sign up for what is going to be an unforgettable year. So fill your boots. It's footy for the fans, 48 hours a day. Preview Fox Footy Channel and Fox Footy Extra from Sunday, March 23. Then call your service provider and get it on. In Tel Aviv, Bob Simon of CBS News, who was held prisoner by Saddam Hussein for 40 days during the 91 Gulf War. In Boston, Brigadier General John C. Reppert, U.S. Army retired, former director of the on-site inspection agency, responsible for inspections under all arms control treaties America signs. Then back in Washington, Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein of California, ranking member of the subcommittee on technology and terrorism. Republican Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah, member of the Select Intelligence Committee. Democratic Congresswoman Jane Harmon of California, ranking member of the Permanent Select Intelligence Committee. And Republican Congressman Chris Shays of Connecticut, chairman of the National Security Subcommittee. All next on Larry King Live. A couple of quick notes because of this, of course, ongoing story. The editions of Larry King Live normally on the weekend, which are taped, will be live. We'll be live throughout this entire crisis, so we'll be with you on Saturday and Sunday and how long it takes. And one of our guests tomorrow night will be General Hugh Shelton, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We begin tonight with Christian Amanpour in Kuwait, Bob Simon in Tel Aviv. Christian, what can you tell us at this point, at this juncture, as uh, America awaits this uh, beginning of a war. Well, the deadline has passed and all is quiet. We don't know when this is going to start. Uh, we were told, as you remember, in that televised address that it will start at a time of the U.S. choosing, and so we still wait. But certainly there has been little bits of news today. The Pentagon and CENTCOM, based in Qatar, nearby, have confirmed that at least the psychological warfare operation seems to be paying a few dividends. We understand 17 Iraqi soldiers have surrendered already, and they are apparently in Kuwaiti custody. They surrendered up there in northern uh, Kuwait, you know, along the border between Kuwait and Iraq. Also, we understand that U.S. and British aircraft have been in some action. They have taken out, we, we are told, 10 artillery pieces in the southern part of Iraq, the southern no-fly zone area, which were deemed apparently to be threatening towards Kuwait. And that is the military news, if you like. There's been a lot of wind and a big sandstorm here, and others have said that that may have hampered some of of the uh, operations, at least as people march and get ready to move their equipment closer to the border. Uh, but we're still waiting, Larry. Bob Simon is a correspondent for CBS News 60 Minutes 2 and a contributor to CBS News regular edition of 60 Minutes on Sundays. He's in Tel Aviv. What, what is the mood there? What, what are the Israelis saying, Bob? Well, Prime Minister Sharon uh, told Israelis today to carry their gas masks with them and to be uh, pretty careful. Um, there doesn't seem to be enormous concern among the uh, uh, among people here, though. The last couple of days have been Purim, which is a, a party holiday, and people have been walking all over Tel Aviv with funny clothes and blue wigs and having a good time. 
Um, I don't think people are terribly, terribly worked up about this. And one of the reasons is that the Israeli military and the Israeli defense establishment and intelligence establishment has been predicting all along that the likelihood of Saddam throwing any scuds this way this time around is, is very unlikely, that he doesn't have much capability, that the new Israeli defense system could deal with it, and that, in fact, he probably doesn't have the desire. So generally, um, it's, uh, people are expectant now. It's uh, enough already with, the, w with waiting. Uh, this has been a very divisive and a very acrimonious and long wait for a war. Um, Israel is just about the only country you can go to outside the United States and the United Kingdom where there's any support for this war. And I think the general Israeli attitude is, let's get on with it. The scene you're seeing, which we've been showing uh, all day, is uh, downtown Baghdad. It is in the early morning hours. Christian, in that regard, as Bob just pointed out, everyone's saying imminent. Is, is there a feeling of imminence there? Is there any, are there lots of rumors going around about when? Here in Kuwait, uh, there are some rumors, yes, and um, also this is probably one of the only other countries, Kuwait, which actually supports this war more than 100%. Uh, the Kuwaitis have lost no time in telling us over and over again that because of what happened to them 12, 13 years ago when Saddam Hussein invaded this country and then the U.S. liberated this country, that they are fully behind it, they want it to happen, and they want Saddam Hussein finally removed. There's been a little bit of, uh, not panic, but a little bit of a uh, hurry to get to the airport is about to be the last day that people can get out today and there were charters laid on for any of those uh, who wanted to get out and of course people have been stockpiling certain food items and things there aren't uh, as many gas masks as they have in Israel here they haven't been provided with them and there many people are complaining about that because people do feel that if there is going to be any retaliation it would be here uh, primarily because there are, you know, tens of thousands mm -hmm. of U.S. and U.K. forces in northern Kuwait. We're going to be learning uh, a lot more about the Iraqi army as the days go on ahead, but uh, Bob Simon is unique. He was captured by them and uh, held for a number of days, 40 days in all. How were you treated? What were they like? Oh, the, the treatment was pretty rough, um, which is one of the reasons I... Uh, uh, opted not to go back to Baghdad uh, this time around. Once, once was enough, and I also think that it's uh, it's going to be very dangerous this time around for journalists, um, mainly because there's bound to be a some period, whether it lasts for hours or days, when Saddam isn't in control anymore, and the Americans aren't either, and it's during a period of chaos such as that that I think it'd be really risky for journalists, particularly for American journalists, so it'll be, um, it could be a very rough ride this time around. Ironically, in the past, Saddam was the journalist's best protection in that he was, he kept the place in order, and as long as he kept it in order, unless he wanted any particular journalist uh, uh, taken, it, it didn't happen. We were taken because uh, we were not in Iraq with, with proper visas. We were captured in a no-man's land between Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. But American journalists in the past who've been covering the war in Iraq or wars in Iraq um, have been uh, have gotten along pretty well. Are you going to are you going to stay fixed, Christian, or will you be moving on? Moving on, Larry. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a it's a fluid situation, as they say. I'm mm. going to be here for perhaps the first hours, and then I'm going to move on just as soon as I can. That's Christian Amanpour. We thank her very much on the scene in Kuwait. Bob Simon, we'll call on him again when we meet uh, uh, General Reppert, and he'll also be on our panel later. But when we come back, we'll talk with a frequent guest on this show and a man who's known his way around war, Senator John McCain. Don't go away.
stories you won't see anywhere else. Arts and culture. Business news. Politics. All of Africa, now. For stories as diverse as the continent, Tumi Mahabu takes you inside Africa. Sundays, only on CNN. It is time to take action. They are building. Hope that this issue can be resolved peacefully. And no without. single nation should be allowed to police the world. They're talking about your world, and they're making decisions that impact your life. You can depend on CNN to be there, live, to tell you what's happening and explain how it affects you. This is history. Be the first to know. Stay with CNN. We're watching United States troops preparing for action. For those of you uh, on television, this program, by the way, is simulcast through uh, Westwood One Radio as well. Joining us now is Senator John McCain, Republican of Arizona, member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, decorated veteran, of course, former uh, Vietnam POW. What, to Senator McCain, is optimum time in a situation like this? I would think, Larry, that it would be in a matter of uh, two or three weeks. Uh, I think we'll see a much shorter bombing campaign than uh, 1991. Um, and if all goes well, it, that could happen. And but that's an awful big if, as you know, the fog of war sometimes causes uh, things to happen mm. that we don't foresee. It's, all, it's pretty much almost daylight in, in Baghdad. Is it automatically assumed that this war will start at night? I think that's the conventional wisdom. I think it's probably logical. It provides our uh, air assets with uh, a little more uh, protection than they would have during the daytime. And there's also the psychological effect uh, of a night attack. So. Uh, it's generally believed that it would start at night, yes. What's it like, you were a pilot, what's it like to be a pilot at, at a moment like this bef in, in readiness? What, what's going through the pilot's mind? Well, the first time in combat, there's a mixture of apprehension, fear, uh, excitement, uh, adrenaline, and uh, a bit of exhilaration in that you're now doing what you've been training for for a long period of time. And uh, a lot of these pilots, it will be their first time into combat. As you know, it's been some years since the Gulf War. Uh, but there's also a sense that, that uh, you're doing what your commander-in-chief has ordered you to do and what your country expects you to do, and there's a certain amount of pride there. Do you think the country is prepared for what might happen? I think the country is proud of our leadership, proud of the men and women in the military, I think they're going to be proud to liberate a, a, a millions of people, a nation that has lived under the most brutal and sadistic kind of oppression for a long period of time. And I think we will be proud of the outcome and uh, we will live in a safer world. I think protests will stop? Well, I hope so, because, you know, there comes a time for debate and discussion and protest, and then there comes a time where we should rally behind the president and the troops when we go into a conflict. Um, uh, look, um, it's, it's not possible to only support the troops and not their mission. I mean, that, that, that's just a contradiction. So I hope that, uh, except for isolated incidents, most people will now spend their time showing their support and their pride in these young men and women who are the very, very best. Uh, I mean, they, they are spectacular people. You've, you've had them on, on this yeah. show. And uh, so we can be proud of them. And I believe that every action, including additional risk to the lives of American fighting men and women, have been taken in order to avoid unnecessary civilian casualties. Yesterday on the floor of the Senate, you defended the administration's not giving projections of what this is going to cost. Why? Well, I, I think that they could have given us some parameters, uh, but it is very difficult to know whether this war would last in the most optimal sense in a matter of a few weeks or could drag out for months. Uh, uh, I, I, th I think that it was uh, very difficult, and it's also difficult to know how much it's going to cost to rebuild Iraq and who will join us. I, I'm confident that many other nations will, but um, I, I don't think it's knowable except within certain parameters. 
Is there a possibility that the army may, the Iraqi army may toss it up and surrender? I think. I mean, they've got to be thinking about what's coming. I think there are very few Iraqi soldiers who are ready to die for Saddam Hussein. There's a Republican guard uh, who know that they will, uh, they will meet a very serious fate at the hands of their fellow citizens. So I think they'll fight. Um, but uh, I, I think you will see uh, look, bad things can happen. He can set the oil wells on fire. He may fire a Scud missile at Israel or at our troops with a chemical weapon. I mean, bad things will happen. That's why this is the last option. But his ability to resist militarily for an extended period of time is, is just about nil. Are you concerned about terror at home? We're under an orange alert again. I think we're always concerned, but I have never been under the impression that al-Qaeda and other people who want to harm us have taken a holiday while they were waiting uh, to see whether we attack Iraq or not. I think they're working night and day consistently, uh, so I'm not sure that the threat is significantly higher than it is all the time. And, and again, I want to add, I think we've made significant progress uh, in combating uh, the, the terrorists by the arrests and some of the other actions we've taken, but we, we still live under that threat and will for a long time. What about the threat of Saddam's using chemical uh, weaponry against the troops? We, we have provided our troops with equipment. I think that, that uh, we've done the best we can to protect them. I think it, it can, it can uh, be very dangerous, and one of the reasons why we took out a few artillery pieces earlier today, I think, was to help prevent that. I worry more about an attack on Israel uh, because they, they obviously can't provide their citizens with the pre protective equipment that we can our own people. But I'm also curious, uh, even if Saddam Hussein orders such attacks, I'm wondering if there are people who are willing to carry out those orders. Yet Bob Simon says Israel is almost unanimously in favor of this, where they face, according to you, the imminent danger. Well, the Israelis know that the longer they live next to Saddam Hussein, the more likely it is that they, like his other neighbors have in the past, might uh, uh, experience an attack from him. Uh, I think they would be very, very relieved to see him gone from the neighborhood. And, and by the way, I think his other neighbors will also. Senator, it's always good uh, having you with us. We'll be calling you lots, uh, calling on you lots in the nights ahead. Thank you, Larry. Senator John McCain, Republican of Arizona, member of the Armed Services Committee. When we come back, Bob Simon will rejoin us from Tel Aviv and Brigadier General John Reppert, United States Army retired, will be aboard. As we go to break, another live shot of Baghdad in the early morning hours. Don't go away. This is CNN Breaking News. We interrupt uh, Larry King Live to bring you this news just into CNN. Officials with Cuba's Civil Aviation Agency say a DC-3 with 35 people on board was hijacked and landed in Key West, Florida with U.S. military escort. Now, the Associated Press reports uh, all 35 people on board were released a half hour after the plane landed Wednesday uh, evening. An FBI spokesman said uh, six hijackers also surrendered to authorities in Key West. Of course, details right now are sketchy at this time, and of course, we will bring you more details as they become available. Once again, officials with Cuba Civil Aviation Agency say a DC-3 with 35 people on board was hijacked and landed in uh, Key West, Florida with a U.S. military escort. All 35 people on board were released a half hour after the plane landed. Again, we will bring you more details as they become available. But for now, though, it's back to Larry King Live. This has been CNN Breaking News. A channel dedicated to keeping the Spanish audience informed and up to date. CNN Plus is more than just news. The stories that matter most as soon as they happen. Spain, Europe, the world. We've got it covered. CNN Plus. A viewer in Nepal recently asked CNN, I would like to know how news presenters react when there is a breaking news situation. Are scripts written for such cases as well? 
It's a very intense and oppression situation when you're on the set doing breaking news. It requires an enormous amount of clarity, of thought, of, of presence of mind. The control room here really supports us in the sense that they tell us who we're interviewing next, tell us what new video we have. We also have access to the news wires that tell us uh, who is reporting what, so we're able to quote, say, Reuters or the Associated Press and attribute these, some of the information that we're getting. But really, as the story unfolds, we piece it together as you see it. And that's what breaking news is. And it's all ad lib. There are no scripts most of the time. And we all fly by the seat of our pants, and usually it comes together. As we look at a picture of the White House at night, Ari Fleischer, the presidential press spokesman, said there's no evidence that Saddam Hussein has left the country. Disarmament will happen at a time of the president's choosing. The president's mood this evening is that the American people are ready to disarm Saddam Hussein and they understand what's at stake. The military is ready. Our cause is just. Bob Simon rejoins us. He's in Tel Aviv, Israel. In Boston is Brigadier General John Reppert, United States Army retired, former director of on-site inspection agency responsible for carrying out inspection requirements under, verica under verification provisions of numerous arms control treaties. And along the Kurdish front line is Brent Sadler, and we'll have some questions for Brent as well. We'll start with the general. General, does all, uh, all of this look in readiness to you? Is this a go? I think that we are fully ready. We obviously don't have the advantages of having the 4th Division up in Turkey, which would have simplified it somewhat, but we're prepared to go with the plan we have. Is this at all involved with any treaties being broken? No, the argument here is violation of the UN sanctions that have been put on him, and the UN provisions are what we're after in Iraq. All this is because of 1441? 1441, 787, and other hmm. resolutions going all the way back to 1991, when at the end of the Gulf War he agreed to get rid of all weapons of mass destruction and to cooperate with international inspectors in doing so, something he has yet to achieve. Brent Sadler, what can you tell us about where you are, the Kurdish front line, and what's, what's happening? Well, Larry, you can see the road behind me through the night scope lens here. That is a main route into Kirkuk, the oil-rich city. Senator McCain, one of your guests a moment ago, talking about the possibility of Saddam Hussein detonating those oil fields. It's along this road that you might see that happening should those orders be carried out by soldiers. Very spooky around here. Iraqi troops only three miles behind me within mortar range in this area. Kurdish fighters really watching and waiting. I asked them if they were afraid. The Kurdish fighters here on this front line said, no, we're not afraid. Saddam Hussein is the one who should be afraid. Are any American soldiers, military people, with you there? No, Larry. We've seen no American military personnel on the ground at all. Special forces, for sure, out and about in this Kurdish enclave. And I do believe, according to Kurdish sources, that if Turkey gives airspace approval for U.S. planes to come in, we'd see a pretty rapid deployment into the Kurdish enclave of the Airborne, 101st Airborne Division, and more Special Force troops. And you can say it's a pretty safe bet we'd see this road behind me to Kirkuk at some stage after an invasion gets underway using this route south to get to Kirkuk. Bob Simon, I know you'll be part of our panel at the bottom of the hour. Do you have a question for General Ruppert? Well, I, I think the General uh, uh, seems to feel that the military campaign will be relatively smooth and from every from the little i know I, I definitely agree with him i'd be very curious to know what he thinks of the aftermath how he thinks the americans will be prepared to occupy iraq which seems to be their intention how long they'll be there and how much to what extent the iraqi people will stand for it general i think you have a couple factors there first there will be a period of occupation how long that will be is probably between two and five years. Whether it is Americans doing it is still very much up in the air. There are other countries who have assisted in this operation, and there will be far more that will be willing to come in after the fighting is done. Bob, John McCain fears an attack on Israel. You're there. Do you fear it? No, I don't, in fact. Uh, once again, there's a very limited area in Iraq from which the Iraqis could fire scuds, 
uh, there's a lot of confidence here that this area has been studied very intensely by the Americans and probably by the Israelis as well. And there's also the question whether even if Saddam could do it, whether he'd want to. It seems that uh, this, is, this war, this particular war from Saddam's point of view is not about Israel. The last one was to a great extent. Mm. This one is about America and America's desire to unseat him. And I think any damage he can wreak or feels he can wreak, he will try to wreak against the Americans, not against Israel. Brent Sadler, will you tell me, are you there for the duration or are you going to be mobile? Well, Larry, here for duration, certainly mobile, yes. Uh, we've got mobile mm -hmm. dishes out here. And the intention is to use roads like this one behind me and also into Mosul with my CNN colleagues to move with the flow, if you like, when things start rolling, when the invasion gets underway, uh, to really head towards Kirkuk, Mosul, if these cities are to fall fairly quickly, and then, of course, on to Baghdad, if that's possible. But this is a very fluid area. No U.S. forces here. No embedding for the journalists from here. We're pretty free to go where we like which, of course, brings its inherent dangers with that on the ground here. Larry. General, how would you compare this to 1991? Uh, well, it's different in many ways. First, the goal in 1991 was to liberate Kuwait. Here it is to bring down the regime in Iraq. In 1991, the troops that left Kuwait knew they would be falling back under Saddam's command and control and would have to accept the consequence of their action. In this case, they're far more likely to surrender in the outlying areas because they know Saddam will be gone in a week or two weeks, and they won't have to worry about his actions. Thank you, General. Brigadier General John Reppert in Boston will be calling on him again. Brent Sadler, we thank him at the Kurdish front line. Bob Simon will remain with us and will be joined by Senators Orrin Hatch and Dianne Feinstein and Congressman Chris Shays and Congresswoman Jane Harmon, and will include your phone calls, too. You're watching Larry King Live. Don't go away. Opening round, Warren. Most anticipated game of the year. It's like New Year's Day for AFL fans. And there's only three short hours to go. Six months of waiting. People get excited. They get a bit toey. They could get out of control. Hey, slow down. It's not a race. Yeah, single file there. Footy's back March 28. It's New Year's Day for footy fans. One in every crowd, Warren. He is serious about your sport. Oh, fantastic. He just scored 50 bucks. And another. <laughs> and another. And you want your mates to know what you know. It's sport every minute of the day. And yes, he's got him onto the team. So get them on the team. And you get $50 credited into your account. He's got big time. And we'll give your mate a sports pack. Oh, what a beauty. Now everyone's a winner. To see just how serious we are about sport, see your program guide for details. Ah, get it on. Hi, I'm Kevin Lettel. There are songs that you want to remember forever, just like there are experiences that I will cherish for life, like the warmth of the Filipinos and the graciousness of your airline, Philippine Airlines, the care, the comfort, the experience. Philippine Airlines, it's about experience. Countdown to war on the next in sight. As the US deadline for Saddam Hussein draws near, the world awaits a military attack against Iraq. What are the possible consequences? In sight only on CNN. We're back with an early morning shot of Baghdad. 
on what is now Thursday morning. Staying with us from Tel Aviv is Bob Simon of CBS News 60 Minutes 1 and 2. Joining us in Washington, Senator Orrin Hatch, Republican of Utah, member of the Select Committee on Intelligence. Senator Dianne Feinstein, Democrat of California, ranking member of Judiciary Subcommittee on Terrorism, Technology, and Homeland Security. In Washington as well as Congressman Christopher Shays, Republican of Connecticut, Chairman of Government Reform Subcommittee on National Security. And Representative Jane Harmon, Democrat of California, ranking member of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. We'll be asking questions, of course. Bob Simon will be included. And if Bob has some questions for our panel of legislators, uh, he may well chime in as well. Senator Hatch, uh, how close is this? When you got some thoughts on when this is all going to happen? Well, I'm not going to even speculate about that, but I know that the president has given the 48-hour warning, and I, I suspect that, uh, that, you know, he's going to make the right decision when the time comes. Senator Feinstein, you have any thoughts on the beginning of it all? Well, I think it's immediate, probably a matter of hours, um, unless something happens to prevent it. Congressman Shays? Well, we're going to do it at our own choosing. And uh, if we keep them up a few hours, uh, just wondering, I, it probably is to our advantage. And Congresswoman Harmon? My thoughts are with our young soldiers and their families. Uh, I'm sure this is a, a tough moment for them, but they're ready, they're well-equipped, and they're going to win. Bob Simon, is there any expectation uh, over there in Tel Aviv as to when this might begin? I, I think people here expect it to begin very soon. I, I know I do. Uh, so much of this uh, whole campaign is political and psychological. Everyone is primed for it now. I would lay odds that it'll begin in the next 48 hours. I think there would be an enormous psychological letdown and disappointment if it didn't begin. I mean, everyone is providing around-the-clock coverage now, and I think that, um, that the uh, administration wouldn't want, to, um, wouldn't want to waste everyone's time. Senator Hatch, what's the re response if chemical or biological weapons are used against the military? Well, I can tell you we're not going to put up with it. Our, our young men and women, I think, are well protected, well trained, and able to do it. But I think it's time for all of us to lend our prayers and our faith in their behalf because, uh, you know, let's face it, this uh, no military action is, is easy. No military action, no matter how superior our forces are, and they are, is going to be without some uh, some incidents that are going to be very uh, unhappy incidents but uh, i've got to tell you our our young men and women are prepared they're ready to go uh, we've got faith in them and uh, and and uh, i think the president is, uh, is can rely on them there's no question about it and all of us can too senator feinstein you think the public is united behind them Oh, I think the public is definitely united behind them. And I'd just like to take a crack at answering your question on uh, what would happen if he did use chemical or biological uh, weapons. I think it would be the worst mistake he could make, and it would be a complete vindication for the American perspective. So um, it's going to be very interesting to see. Um, I hope he doesn't. Um, I agree with those who said that our, our people are prepared for it, should it happen, uh, but it would be the, the greatest mistake Saddam could make. Uh, Congressman Chase, what, uh, give me the concept of what you constitute as victory. Victory will mean? Well, this is a battle. It's a, a war against terrorism at home and abroad. It's a continuation of what we began in Afghanistan, but ultimately it's a, a war of liberation as well for the Iraqi people who have been in bondage not just for 12 years but even before that and so what I'm hoping is that the Iraqi people will uh, will be thrilled to be free will have the food they need the medicine they need and will see a better future that's what my hope is Congresswoman Harmon is there a worst case scenario well sure there is um, war is hell and it's unpredictable how this will go but I would say Larry that uh, victory will mean uh, displaying for the world the evidence of weapons of mass destruction and the horrors and torture of, of a generation of abuse by this dictator, and then rebuilding the country with a multinational coalition and the emergence of an indigenous, transparent, moderate, democratic regime in Iraq run by the people of Iraq for them. Uh, I think that that will be a marvelous victory. Bob Simon, if you have any questions for any of our legislators,
Uh, feel free to go ahead. Do you have one now? No, but I have a reflection on what victory means. Getting okay. rid of Saddam Hussein, getting him out of power anyway, will be pretty easy. I mean, this is the New York Yankees against Podunk High. I don't think we're going to know whether or not it's a victory or not for several years. And we'll know if there is a, a stable, relatively representative government in Iraq, which is an ally of the United States, which is not intent on destroying Israel, and which lessens our dependence on Saudi oil. It's going to take a long time before we know whether we've been victorious in any of those senses. Senator Hatch, do you see a long occupation here? Well, there's no question that if, uh, that as we go into Baghdad and as we take over and, and effectuate hopefully a regime change uh, and uh, hopefully bring about a representative government of Iraqis uh, who would govern themselves, it's going to take some time and we're going to have to uh, be there to make sure that it goes well. But I think it's going to be effective for all of the Middle East. It's going to be, uh, once this is done, I think the whole Middle East, is, Middle East is going to benefit from it, but uh, there's no question it's going to be difficult, no question it's going to take time, no question it's going to uh, require uh, some help from us, but still our goal is to have Iraqis run Iraq, have them benefit from their oil, have them benefit uh, Ari Fleischer, and bring, excuse me, bring Senator care. Hatch, excuse me, Senator. Ari sure, Fleischer, sure. Uh, the presidential press spokesman, is going to uh, speak to reporters, I'm told. Is it now? Oh, well, then why did I interrupt him? Senator Feinstein, yeah, <laughs> they told me to interrupt you, but That's we're not going to. <laughs> Listen, I'm interrupted me, all the uh, time. <laughs> yeah. let, let me just quickly give you my sure. view. Um, I think this is the hard part. Uh, first of all, I, I hope that the military part is quick. I hope that as few people as possible are killed. Um, I hope our targets are accurately hit. I hope there's not collateral damage. Um, and then I hope there can be a period of stability. This is not going to be easy. This country has never known democracy. It has always known hard rule, despotic rule. And so to change it is going to be extraordinarily difficult. So in my view, a period of stability, I think there is going to need to be an American presence there for a while. Uh, I think there's going to have to be a major effort to prevent the blood feuds uh, from emerging, which okay. has so typified the history I'm going to interrupt of the country. You. Right, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm told that air raid sirens are now being heard in Baghdad. Air raid sirens are now being heard in Baghdad right now, and you're looking at Baghdad right now. And I understand that John King, our senior White House correspondent, is standing by, and we're expecting some sort of announcement from uh, Ari Fleischer. Is John King ready to go? Okay, so he's not... Okay, as soon as we make contact with John King, we'll go to him and he'll tell us what Ari Fleisch is going to be talking about. But we're getting reports of... Is this the beginning, do you think, Congressman Shays? Listen. Congressman Shays? No, I don't. Okay, I'm hearing lots of different Ari, voices. I, one thing I'd love you to know is this is not an easy decision for any member of Congress or the Senate. And this all kind of takes our breath away and our prayers are with our soldiers, but we know the rightness of what we're doing. You want to add something, Jane? It's a sober moment. Uh, I'd also say, though, that other parts of the world are dangerous as we speak. And as we watch this war unfold, and it does sound like it's starting any moment or it may have started, we have to think about North Korea. We have to think about India-Pakistan. We have to think about Israel-Palestine. We have to think about Iran. It will be critical, and, and victory will be measured in part also by whether this administration can keep, keep its eye on the other hot spots in the world and have a balanced right. and successful policy there. You getting any clue about these air raid sirens, Bob Simon? And I may have to interrupt you at any moment. No, okay. I all right, let's uh, hold it, hold it, Bob. I'm gonna let's go, let's go to Aaron Brown in Atlanta, and he'll get us up to date. Aaron, everyone, as you uh, stand by, Larry. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. As Larry has said, and we are now hearing reports, air raid sirens are going off in Baghdad. We're also getting indications from our correspondent there, Nick Robertson, that it. It is very possible things are underway. Nick is on the phone. Nick, in Baghdad, what can you tell us? Nick, it's Aaron. Can you hear me? Stationary cameras that are set up around the city. Um, it is early morning there, very early morning. The sun yet to come up, as you can tell. Nick, it's Aaron. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? 
Yes, I can. What can you tell us, Nick? I stand by. Nick, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, what we heard here in Baghdad a few minutes ago were the air raid sirens going off. We could hear in the distance around the city the sound of anti-aircraft anti -aircraft guns being fired. No indication uh, at this time that uh, there is any air campaign ongoing other than the fact that the air raid siren went off. The anti-aircraft guns started firing from several locations around the city. It is still very early in the morning here. The streets are quiet as they have been all night. Uh, the city, uh, this time, is still a city that has all its street lights on, even though the, the sun is just coming up here. Um, as far as we can see at the moment, the city does not appear to be under attack, but the air raid sirens did go off, and Iraqi anti-aircraft gun positions did fire into the air about two or three minutes ago. Has anything like that happened in the last 24 or 48 hours? 48 hours. Ab absolutely not. It appears that Iraq's uh, air defenses are on a hair trigger here, if you will, at this time. Obviously, uh, once the 48-hour uh, deadline that President Bush uh, put into place for President Saddam Hussein to leave the country, the forces here certainly knew they had to be on a defensive standby. I can hear more anti-aircraft gunfire erupting uh, across the city at this time. I don't see any trace of fire. I see trace of fire flying through the air, uh, past this hotel. Yeah, now heavy bursts of uh, anti-aircraft gunfire coming up from the cities, uh, coming up from across the city. Heavy anti-aircraft gunfire coming up at this time. And so far, we haven't seen any major detonations uh, at this time. But it does appear that Iraq's air defenses at least perceive that they are under threat at this time. Nick, we're able, we are now able to also hear I gather through the phone line the same anti-aircraft fire you are hearing. Just stay with me. We expect. Uh, that, we that's ex correct. You may be able to hear the anti-aircraft gunfire erupting across the city. From where I'm standing, the anti-aircraft gunfire and tracer fire appears to be coming up from at least half a dozen locations across the city. Bursts of uh, the red tracer fire flying up in the air. Red tracer fire, yellow tracer fire coming from multiple points across the city. Nick, just to be... Out across the, the, yes, go ahead. Nick, just to be clear, everything you are seeing at this point is going from the ground up. You, are, you have yet to see that anything is, from is, the sky that is, down. That is absolutely correct. As I look out across the city at this time, where I'm not seeing any detonations, I'm not seeing any explosions um, impacting on the ground. What we are seeing at the moment, and we have not felt any detonations on the ground, the tracer fire and the anti-aircraft guns are firing intensively in the air from a, from a significant number of locations. As yet, though, we have yet to see an impact on the ground at this time. Certainly it appears that Iraq's air defense system believe that the uh, city is under attack or at least under a threat at this moment. All right, Nick, just stand down for a second, okay? Don't go away, but just stand down for a second, okay? okay. That's Nick Robertson in Baghdad. It, it is now coming up towards 6 o'clock in the morning. It's about 5.45 in the morning there. This anti-aircraft fire has been going on. Jamie McIntyre is at the Pentagon. Uh, Jamie, is it begun or is this a false alarm? Well, I'm not sure it's a false alarm, but uh, as near as we can tell, this is not the beginning of the war. Uh, what we were lead to be believe was that overnight there would be additional strikes that would, quote, prepare the battlefield. Now, we thought those strikes would probably be in the southern no-fly zone. It's possible uh, that southern no-fly zone is in the 33rd parallel, which is south of Baghdad. It's possible they've struck above the 33rd parallel, close to Baghdad. Again, perhaps taking out uh, some uh, air defenses or some other thing that's perceived as a threat. Now, we were given an indication there would be some activity, but that the war would not be starting at this timetable. So and, and we're going to have to wait and see what the uh, White House has to say. Uh, and in fact, we heard uh, this afternoon um, a top uh, Pentagon official say when it starts, there won't be any doubt about it. 
Um, so we just, we're, I think we're trying to sort through exactly what we have this early morning. We do expect to hear from the White House shortly. These again, for those of you who are just joining us, are pictures of Baghdad. These are stationary cameras that are set up in a number of locations around the city. Uh, Anti-aircraft fire has been going off in the city for some time, but Nick Robertson, who is in Baghdad and I think still on the phone with us, has reported that everything he has seen and heard is all going from the ground up. It is all anti-aircraft going, uh, fire going up, but to this point he has seen no indication of anything, any bombs, any missiles, any planes coming down. Nick, have you heard any aircraft in the air? Not at this time, Aaron. The uh, air raid warning siren here went off about uh, 10 to 12 minutes ago. There was a brief burst of anti-aircraft gunfire that sounded distant towards the uh, periphery of the city. Then as I was talking to you, it appeared that the anti-aircraft batteries within the city opened up. Some appearing to come from government buildings. They appear to be, they appear to be opening up now perhaps to the uh, eastern, southeastern side of the city, the anti-aircraft batteries. Uh, Nick, I'm going to interrupt you here. Yeah. All right. I'm going to interrupt. Ari Fleischer, the president's spokesman. The opening stages of the disarmament of the Iraqi regime have begun. The president will address the nation at 10.15. Well, that is about as simple and direct as it could possibly be. The opening stages of the disarmament of Iraq, the words the White House chose to frame this in tonight, has begun, and the president will address the country in a half an hour from now, nigh at uh, 10 15 uh, Eastern Time, 30 minutes from now. Our senior White House correspondent, John King, joins us. John? Aaron, the White House choosing this Bush White House, choosing exactly the same model as the previous Bush White House. Marlon Fitzwater, 12 years ago, Ari Fleischer tonight, reading a one-line statement saying the beginning of hostilities has happened inside Iraq. We will hear from the president in 30 minutes. Let me tell you this, earlier today, some indications this would not happen tonight. That guidance began to change. The president left for the residence. He had dinner with the first lady. But we also are told he has been in constant contact with his senior staff, Chief of Staff Andy Card, his national security advisor. Condoleezza Rice, a rarity as well. Vice President Dick Cheney is in the White House late tonight. Rare is the moment when the President and the Vice President are in the same building because of the security precautions underway, the risk of terrorist attack here at the White House. You just heard that one line from Ari Fleischer, Fleischer saying the beginning of the liberation of Iraq has begun. We will hear from the President of the United States in the Oval Office, as promised, 1015, just moments away from now. Uh, yeah, about uh, 29 minutes from now. John, you said that uh, earlier in the day, all of the indications you were getting, certainly all the indications that we were getting, is that this would not start uh, today. Uh, then it began to change. Do you have any sense of what changed, why change, any of that at this point? What we are told after the morning meeting, the war planning meeting, we are told the president was waiting for a recommendation from commanders that they thought the circumstances were optimum to begin an attack. There were questions about the sandstorms today and whether that would slow the forward deployment. There were questions about whether other resources were ready on the ground, and the White House kept insisting the deadline tonight was a political deadline for Saddam Hussein to accept exile, not a military deadline in any way for the president, and that he would wait until he received word from commanders that they thought it was the time to go forward. Forward. There was then a second war planning meeting in the early evening hours at the White House. In and of itself, not extraordinary. Those sessions have been two a day for the past several days. But obviously at that meeting tonight, some guidance changed. We are told the president did go to the residence and have dinner with the First Lady. But we also are told he kept in constant touch. And again, the national security staff stayed on hand here at the White House, a rarity for Vice President Dick Cheney to be on hand. And over the past 90 minutes or so, officials told us, be flexible, stand by. We could have a development. We just received it. Only one sentence from Ari Fleischer, but few words, but great drama in what he announced. It certainly the liberation was. of Iraq, the president says, has begun. Um, I heard it as the disarmament, but you may, have heard it better. you may have heard it better than I. Just, John, stay with us for a second. Uh, the picture uh, that you see in the large box there is a picture of Baghdad now. What is eerie about it, for those of you who can remember back 12 years ago to when the first Gulf War began, uh, we all remember 
all of the heavy tracer fire into the night sky, the raining of bombs and missiles coming down. Uh, it is approaching 6 o'clock in the morning now in Baghdad on what looks to be a cloudy day. And while we have heard lots of anti-aircraft fire, fire from the ground up, we have yet to see anything from the sky down on the city. That, of course, doesn't mean that in other parts of the country, to the south or to the north, things are not going on. Jamie McIntyre, do you know yet where this has started? Well, Aaron, I think it's not clear exactly what's going on. Now, I know that uh, it sounded pretty definitive when they said President Bush would be addressing the nation. We were told there might be something the president wanted to comment on that could possibly be less than the actual start of the war, again, in the area of prepping the battlefield. Um, I have not been able to get a clarification, but it appears that there might be some limited strikes uh, that would be very close to Baghdad, perhaps with either planes or cruise missiles, would probably be the most, uh, the weapon of choice. This is, the timing of this is, uh, just seems to be unlikely to be the full-blown start of the well, war, but I have to say, I have same, to get the clarification. Right. At the same time, it's hard to, I mean, we, it's, it is hard to read uh, Ari Fleischer's words in any other way than what he said, that the disarmament of Iraq has begun. Now, we can, I suppose, and will know um, in the next uh, minutes or, or hours what precisely that means, the extent of the beginning, but there's no question that it is on. Um, and so I guess the, the, the question is, where is it on, what is happening, in what parts of the country, and that's what I guess you and we and all of us need to find out and want to know. Uh, Christian Amanpour is in Kuwait City. Christian, um, what are you hearing, I, and I mean that I suppose both literally and from your sourcing? Well, literally, absolutely nothing. We are about 50 kilometers from the border, but we do know, of course, that the British and UK forces have been moving into the demilitarized zone, which straddles the Iraqi-Kuwait border. They've been doing that over the last several days, and that means that they are already a few kilometers into Iraq. As I say, they're straddling that border area. From everything we were led to believe today, the actual massive, what we've been told to expect, massive uh, aerial bombardment of uh, Iraq has not yet happened. Christian, That's what we can uh, see so far. Christian, let me interrupt you for a second. Stand by for a second. I want to go back to the Pentagon. Jamie, you've been able to find out something in the last 30, 40 seconds. Yes, I'm sorry. It, it does appear this is a cruise missile strike against Baghdad. A Pentagon source tells me that this was against a, quote, target of opportunity. So something uh, that they either saw or something popped up that they felt that they sh needed to take a shot at even before they planned the full-blown start of the war. Now, apparently, this is something that is significant enough that President Bush has decided he's going to come out and comment about. And clearly, you can't send cruise missiles into Baghdad without raising the possibility that the war has started. So it really demands clarification. And I'm not sure we'll really know precisely what's going on until we actually hear the words from the White House. But again, CNN has confirmed that the U.S. has launched a cruise missile strike against a, quote, target of opportunity in Baghdad. But this Jamie? does appear to be less than the full war. I'm sorry, Jamie, talk about for a second what a target of opportunity means for people not familiar with the, with the jargon that all of us use. Well, I'd have to, I'm going to go into the area of speculation well, here. Talk broadly, it's just, talk it's broadly about the kind of thing. It's something that have, would not have been there yesterday that they could not have acted against and would have been here today. I mean, broadly, it would be something like a, uh, uh, perhaps, intelligence that showed somebody was in a particular location where they weren't ready to move in with a full uh, uh, invasion, but they wanted to take a shot at that target of opportunity. That would just be an example. Again, I have to stress, I don't know what this target of opportunity was, but I do know that they decided it was important enough to launch some cruise missiles at it uh, in, uh, in the early morning hours here in Baghdad. Okay, Jamie, thank you. The president speaks to the country at 10.15 Eastern time about... Uh, um, 20 minutes, 22 minutes or so from now, Jamie McIntyre reporting from the Pentagon that the, the uh, military command has launched a cruise missile attack on a target of opportunity. We don't know specifically what that was. Uh, perhaps we'll hear more detail there from, from the president. Nick Robertson is in Baghdad. Nick, do you still hear the sounds of anti-aircraft fire? Aaron, the anti-aircraft batteries seem to have died down in the last five minutes or so. Looking across the city, we see no plumes of smoke. 
no indications uh, from this rather lofty vantage point of uh, where this target of opportunity may have been. Certainly, uh, the first detonations coming from the anti-aircraft guns appeared to come from the perimeter of the city, then, uh, then the uh, anti-aircraft guns in the city themselves began firing in the sky, and then after that, again, back to the perimeter of the city. Now, the city is quiet. I see the road is empty, apart from one dog strolling down the road. So at this time, Aaron, difficult for us to say where this target of opportunity may have been. Nick, um, are there all around the city of Baghdad these anti-aircraft batteries Certainly in, the, certainly in the area we are in, we are uh, just across the river from a, an area that has many government buildings. Uh, many of those buildings do indeed have anti-aircraft batteries on them. It's certainly what we saw um, during the Gulf War in 1991. It's certainly what we have read about in analysis of uh, Iraq's uh, military capability at this time. And certainly from what I was seeing, at least from at least half a dozen different batteries lighting up very close into the center of the city here than others further out, Aaron. And it just again, it is coming up on 6 o'clock in the morning in Baghdad, uh, 6 o'clock Thursday morning. Uh, the anti-aircraft fire has subsided a bit. When was the last time that we know Saddam Hussein was in Baghdad? Very difficult to tell, Aaron. Uh, for example, uh, yesterday, Foreign Minister, or the day before yesterday, Foreign Minister Najib Sabri, briefing journalists late in the afternoon, said that he had met with uh, President Saddam Hussein in the morning. But those uh, pictures of the meeting played out on Iraqi television. It was impossible to say where that meeting took place. It appeared to be uh, in a marble hall. It could have been an underground bunker. It's impossible to say where it was. Certainly, uh, Foreign Minister. Prime Minister Sabri was speaking in Baghdad in the uh, mid-afternoon and he said only in that morning that he met with President Saddam Hussein. But impossible to say exactly where that meeting took place, Aaron, or, or President Saddam Hussein's uh, movement. Okay, Nick, stand by as long as you can. Um, Ari Fleischer, a few moments ago, the president's spokesman, for those of you just joining us, came to the podium and said very simply, the opening stages of the disarmament of Iraq have begun. The president will address the nation at 10.15, about uh, uh, 19 minutes or so from now. Walt Rogers is with a unit not far from the Kuwaiti border. We won't say more about it than that. Walt, are you able to hear us? Yes, we do hear you, Aaron. I'm with the U.S. 7th Cavalry along the northern Kuwaiti border. We are in what the Army calls its attack position. We have not yet crossed in, into uh, Iraq at this point. At that point, we will tell you, when we do, of course, that we will cross the line of departure. What we are in is essentially a formation, much the way you would have seen with the U.S. Cavalry in the uh, 19th century American frontier. The um, Bradley tanks, the Bradley fighting vehicles are behind me. Beyond that perimeter, we've got uh, dozens more uh, Bradleys and uh, M1A1 main battle tanks. They are just waiting the order to slip the leashes. Uh, many of these soldiers are more than impatient to go. Every one of the soldiers was saying yesterday, uh, the president has got to order this quickly. Uh, he's got a lot of votes out there, and these young men are tired of sitting in the desert. Last night, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Terry Farrell, the commander of the uh, 7th Cavalry, gave these soldiers a pep talk. He said to them, you better be prepared no, for a no, fight. We are expecting a fight. Although when they get closer to the border, uh, or when they, when they get close to Baghdad, they expect the Iraqis to put up the stiffest resistance. Initially, Colonel Farrell said that he did not expect a terribly large amount of resistance until they, uh, until they get much nearer Baghdad. Aaron? Okay, Walt, just stay, hang on a second. We're looking at a sequence of pictures coming from Baghdad. Some of these are from stationary cameras that um, networks have placed there. Some of them, one of those shots at least, came from Al Jazeera the uh, Arab news station. Um, Walt Rogers, was there, has there been anything in the last hour, two, three hours that suggested to you that this was about to begin? 
Well, we saw a lot of refueling in the ta uh, uh, with tanks and armored vehicles here last night. There's been a lot of activity. However, we remain in the same attack position, the attack formation that we were in probably five hours ago. Again, we do not have a clear indication that even though we're in this attack position, we're going to be ordered forward at this point. The Army is still waiting orders to cross the border, which is very, very close to where we are. Waiting orders to cross that border. The soldiers are more than ready to go. And as I say, uh, the commander of the uh, 7th Cavalry, Lieutenant Colonel Terry Farrell, says he does not expect a terribly large amount of a res resistance uh, initially the first uh, 100 kilometers or so. But as the uh, 7th Cavalry gets closer to Baghdad, that's when they say the resistance will increase. He urged his soldiers to fight hard because he said the Iraqis will be fighting hard. They have to expect that. Although one interesting thing he said was uh, that once you get into Iraq, you can still expect the Iraqis are going to be glad to see you. They're going to be more friendly Iraqis welcoming you than those who are hostile uh, trying to fight you. Uh, Aaron? Walt, thank you. We'll find out. Uh, it appears we're going to find that out plenty soon enough. Thank you, John King at the White House. What do you got? Well, Aaron, a curious point to the speculation you were discussing with Jamie McIntyre earlier. Shortly after the deadline lapsed, Ari Fleischer came into the briefing room and told reporters that Andy Card, the White House Chief of Staff, had checked with the CIA and the National Security Agency, and they had informed him that they had information that Saddam Hussein had not left Iraq and was still in the country. And that information was relayed to President Bush, obviously a critical item of issue at the time of the deadline passing. What the target of opportunity is, as Jamie described it, we do not know, but it would certainly be interesting if it indeed is Saddam Hussein or any key member of the Iraqi leadership, because just moment, just weeks ago in testimony to Congress, Secretary of State Powell was asked by Senator Fritz Hollings of South Carolina, why our war, why don't we just kill him? And Secretary Powell responded, Senator, that would assume that we know where he is, yes. and we don't. Well, and as you know, and as I, I suspect many, if not most of our viewers know, uh, he is a man, Saddam Hussein is a man who rarely sleeps in the same bed two nights in a row. He has many bunkers and palaces, uh, residences uh, all over the country. Uh, he is surrounded by a vast security apparatus to protect him. He is not an easy target. There is also, as I suspect many of you know, there is a literal, literal prohibition against assassinating a foreign leader but once war begins once war begins that prohibition is no longer in play uh, under international law uh, in Kuwait Christian Amanpour and Wolf Blitzer are there I know uh, both of you are working very hard to find out what you can what can you tell us Christian go ahead well earlier today we were talking to a senior UK official UK is going to be in charge of liberating, if you like, the southern part of Iraq. And they were talking about what we might expect at the beginning of a campaign. And we were led to believe that the full-scale beginning that we'd been told about was not going to be immediately after the, uh, after the deadline passed. We were being told that uh, it was going to be a major effort to target military targets only, to rein in quite heavy uh, uh, bombs, precision-guided bombs from land and air and sea, and to try to separate those targets, military targets, from any kind of civilian or indeed any kind of Iraqi military that doesn't want to fight. They're very determined, they say, to try to uh, show the Iraqis from the beginning that they are not out to kill or, or maim unneededly any Iraqi civilians or indeed soldiers who don't want to fight, nor do they want to cause enormous damage to the infrastructure. For instance, we were told today that let's say they want to take a bridge out, instead of hitting the bridge several times like they did 12 years ago, they might put a crater at one end of the bridge on the ground and at the other end and may even leave the bridge standing. Uh. So we're being told that they will be quite a heavy aerial and uh, land-based, uh, rather sea-based bombardment, uh, but their targets are quite precise. As you can see and now... And if I could just weigh in, Aaron... I'm sorry, just, Wolf, just hang, can you, can you just hang with me for one second, Wolf. Uh, just again, we're just a little bit past 10. You're looking at pictures of Baghdad. Uh, we know, because the president's spokesman has told us so, that the opening stages of the disarmament of Iraq is underway. Those were his words. Jamie McIntyre has reported that it was a cruise missile strike at a target of opportunity. Uh, we, we, I think, can flesh that out a little bit more. Jamie, um, at the Pentagon, tell me. 
Well, Aaron, a little bit uh, of a clarification. We're still trying to figure out exactly the nature of this, quote, target of opportunity. It has been described to me now as a leadership target, which, again, makes it even more intriguing it sure about does. what it is it could possibly be a leadership target. Another uh, defense official said to me that it was not a target that suddenly appeared. It's one they've known about for a while, but it was one that they decided to, uh, to take a strike at with uh, these cruise missiles. So there are a little piece of the puzzle. We are being told now this was a leadership target. I apologize for stepping on you there. There are perhaps a hundred or so uh, people that the United States would have insisted leave Sorry. Iraq along with uh, Saddam Hussein and his sons. Whether that was any of them were involved in this, we don't know. We'll find out soon enough, we expect. Um, Wolf Blitzer, we interrupted you a moment ago in Kuwait. Uh, Aaron, uh, first of all, here in Kuwait, it's just uh, obviously just early hours of the morning, very quiet. There's no visible signs whatsoever here of any serious military activity in Kuwait City, although we are relatively far away from the northern part of Kuwait along the border, of course, with Iraq. That's where there are uh, more than 100,000 U.S. troops, another 30,000 or so. British troops, they're obviously uh, gearing up to move into Iraq at some point, precisely when, of course, remains up in the air. I also want to caution our viewers to, to appreciate the fact that while we do have cameras, live cameras, around uh, Baghdad, and we're seeing those live pictures, we don't necessarily have live cameras elsewhere around Iraq. And Iraq is a huge country the size of about California. So while there may be a strike, there may be anti-aircraft batteries going off in Baghdad, we have no idea what may be happening happening around the other parts of Iraq where there are what the U.S. military calls these targets of opportunity, whether there are also airstrikes underway elsewhere in Iraq or whether this is strictly limited to Baghdad where we do have these stationary cameras, as you point out, which can detect what's going on to a certain degree. We also have our own Nick Robertson in Baghdad as well. Aaron? Thank you, Wolf. Uh, again, we're seeing some pictures of Baghdad. We have yet to see uh, anything that indicates uh, missiles uh, crashing down on any of the buildings from any of the stationary cameras we've set up. Nick Robertson, who has been in Baghdad now for some time, is still on the phone with us. Nick, is there uh, still the sound of anti-aircraft fire? What is there now? Aaron. Indeed, in just in the last few minutes, the anti-aircraft gunfire picked up again. It subsided. It appears to be that the anti-aircraft fire responding to some perceived threat, a threat that we can't see and a threat that we can't hear at this time. There are clouds over the city, perhaps at about 5,000 feet or so, and perhaps the clouds even lower. The visibility here, perhaps only as much as uh, five to five to six miles at this time. So while we have a good view over the city, very difficult to see perhaps as far as we would normally see. The anti-aircraft gunfire uh, right now has gone, has gone silent. The city is very quiet right now. No traffic on the roads, uh, but we're watching and waiting to see what will happen. For those who keep track of such things, all of this began less than two hours after the deadline passed, the deadline that President Bush imposed a couple of nights ago, the 48 hours for Saddam Hussein and his sons to, uh, to get out of town and to get out of the country. There, have been, there was at least one offer uh, of a home in Bahrain if Saddam Hussein wanted to go there and leave. There was no indication and almost literally no one believed he would uh, leave that way, that he would uh, go down. Um, if that's the way it's going to play out, you can hear the anti-aircraft fire. Just go ahead and take that full for a minute. Just listen. These are the sounds of Baghdad this morning. No one expected that Saddam would leave the country. Uh, he has a, a very much a messianic view of himself and his place in Iraqi history. And most everyone in the intelligence community believed that a life in exile was not at all how he saw his final days. The president will speak to the country in about seven minutes or so. And a lot of what we have been trying to sort out for the last 20, 25 minutes or so will become much clearer. But there is no question, no question, 
that the campaign is on, that this long buildup, these months of negotiations has now ended this night in war. John King at the White House. Well, Aaron, a little bit more of an explanation as to why the tenor changed here. Still a mystery as to what this target of opportunity in Baghdad was. But we are now told, and this confirms our earlier guidance, that not much would happen tonight, that at the afternoon meeting, the second of the two daily war planning sessions, we were told by a senior administration official that the president was told there was some concern that there could be an opportunity lost in the hours after the deadline lapsed. What that opportunity is remains a mystery to us. Perhaps the president will fill us in. But we are told that is why the president stayed close by, even though he did go to the residence for a little bit. His entire senior staff is here, including the speechwriting staff, the vice president, and the national security team on hand. Something at that afternoon meeting convinced the president to what appears to us to launch an isolated strike as part of the beginning of what will be the larger military operation. Again, we'll hear more from the president in just a few minutes. The, the question John and Jamie and Christian and Wolf, I think that all of us have at this moment is the degree to which they are about, they being the United States military and the British allies, the degree to which they are about to roll out uh, the entire campaign, um, I believe. And tell me in the booth if I'm right that uh, General Wesley Clark, retired General Wesley Clark, is available to us um, at at this point. Do we have it, General Clark? Uh, yes, I am here, Aaron. Uh, I'm, I'm curious what your sense of this moment is. If this is how you thought the opening stages of this war would would play out. Well, it was always difficult to predict exactly what would happen. I mean, the moonlight data, for one thing, I mean, we were almost at full illumination last night. For another, the deadline really came at 4 o'clock in the morning, Iraqi time, so there wasn't much darkness anyway. Could have gone ahead with a full-scale, uh, you know, th the, the big shock and awe firepower. It could be happening right now, for all we know, because we're so dominant that it really isn't a matter of darkness anymore. And then there's a question of when the ground troops are going to move. Now, we've just seen the report from the 7th Cav unit. That should be a unit with the 3rd Infantry Division. It would be up in the front of the division force, presumably, performing its role as an advance guard or covering force. The American forces are going to, they're going to be reconnaissance-led. They're going to have scouts out. They're going to have helicopters up when it's time to move. But the timing and the sequence of all this is something that has been, no doubt, extensively war-gamed by the commanders on the ground. They've looked for every advantage on how to do this. And uh, it's, it's tough to call. It could be simultaneous. It could be delayed. We just don't know right now, Aaron. General, this notion that a target of opportunity appeared, and just, um, and I'm not, uh, in fairness, I'm not sure if it was Jamie McIntyre or John King. I think it was Jamie who said it didn't just suddenly appear. It's something that, that planners uh, were aware of. Uh, uh, would happen. Is that the kind of thing that as a, a commander in a situation like this you would like to trigger H hour? It, it might be, uh, but if it was attacked by cruise missiles, for example, then they take their flight time takes some time to come in from the Persian Gulf and it takes more time to, to get them set. So it wasn't a sudden decision. It may have been a target of opportunity that was being watched and suddenly they decided to go after it but they had everything lined up and, and the gyros spinning and ready to launch. The other thing, Aaron, that I'm thinking of is you may recall in the Afghanistan campaign there was criticism early on that some way we had not acted to shoot at an, a vehicle and mm -hmm. perhaps Mullah Omar had escaped in that vehicle or Osama yeah. bin Laden. And uh, maybe this was the case where uh, they had an opportunity, they were going to strike that target anyway, they got the intelligence and they said, well, let's just go right now regardless of what the main attack says, go right now for this particular high-value target. Okay, Wes, thank you. Stand by General Clark. I'll try not to call you Wes too many times tonight. Call me Wes, that's fine. Thank you, sir. Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon. Jamie. Well, Aaron, I just want to point out that uh, we are getting uh, guidance from defense officials that this is not necessarily something that's going to result in the rest of the campaign being rolled out. But like uh, John uh, King said from the White House, that there was the feeling that they could miss an opportunity if they waited for when they planned to start the whole war. So they went ahead and decided to take these. I asked one senior defense official who I reached at home tonight, uh, is it possible that the rest of the war will be starting now? And he said, believe me, I wouldn't be home eating a bowl of Cheerios at my, uh, in my kitchen if that were the case. So, Jamie, thank you. I'll just you. pass that along for what it's worth. 
Jamie, thank you. Um, again, let's just reorient those of you anti-aircraft fire uh, you heard in the streets of Baghdad. We know uh, we are. We, are, we can confirm that a cruise missile strike on a target of opportunity, and we hope we'll find out more specifically what that is. We know from Nick Robertson, who is there, that this, and we just lost one of those cameras, and whether we have lost all of those cameras, and for how long we have lost them, we do not know. Uh, but we can. We have now lost the only window uh, that we had into Baghdad. The president will speak to the country in about a minute or so from the White House. What room in the White House? Well, I cannot tell you, though. I, I would suspect it will come from the Oval Office. John King, do you know? Uh, Nick, yes. you have something. Aaron, you indeed, we we a statement just read on Iraq's radio services here. A message from the read by a presenter from President, President uh, Saddam Hussein's eldest son, Uday Saddam Hussein, saying, God protects us from foreign aggressors. God gives us patience. God protect, uh, God protect our leader. That just read a few minutes ago a message from Uday Saddam Hussein, the President's eldest son, read on Iraqi radio this morning. That's what people here will be hearing as they also hear the anti-aircraft gunfire in this city. Aaron? Nick, Nick, thank you. Thursday morning, now just before, just after uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, the President of the United States, uh, for the second time, is about to tell the country that it is at war. Uh, he did it on a Sunday when the war in Afghanistan began in those months after 9-11, and in just a moment he is about to do it again. Here is the President. Five, four, three, two, one. My fellow citizens. At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. More than 35 countries are giving crucial support, from the use of naval and air bases, to help with intelligence and logistics, to the deployment of combat units. Every nation in this coalition has chosen to bear the duty and share the honor of serving in our common defense. To all the men and women of the United States Armed Forces now in the Middle East, the peace of a troubled world and the hopes of an oppressed people now depend on you. That trust is well placed. The enemies you confront will come to know your skill and bravery. The people you liberate will witness the honorable and decent spirit of the American military. In this conflict, America faces an enemy who has no regard for conventions of war or rules of morality. Saddam Hussein has placed Iraqi troops and equipment in civilian areas, attempting to use innocent men women and children as shields for his own military, a final atrocity against his people. I want Americans and all the world to know that coalition forces will make every effort to spare innocent civilians from harm. A campaign on the harsh terrain of a nation as large as California could be longer and more difficult than some predict. And helping Iraqis achieve a united, stable, and free country will require our sustained commitment. We come to Iraq with respect for its citizens, for their great civilization, and for the religious faiths they practice. We have no ambition in Iraq except to remove a threat and restore control of that country to its own people. I know that the families of our military are praying that all those who serve will return safely and soon. Millions of Americans are praying with you for the safety of your loved ones and for the protection of the innocent. For your sacrifice, you have the gratitude and respect of the American people. And you can know that our forces will be coming home as soon as their work is done. Our nation enters this conflict reluctantly, yet our purpose is sure. The people of the United States and our friends and allies will not live at the mercy of an outlaw regime that threatens the peace with weapons of mass murder. 
We will meet that threat now with our Army, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, and Marines so that we do not have to meet it later with armies of firefighters and police and doctors on the streets of our cities. Now that conflict has come, the only way to limit its duration is to apply decisive force. And I assure you, this will not be a campaign of half measures, and we will accept no outcome but victory. My fellow citizens, the dangers to our country and the world will be overcome. We will pass through this time of peril and carry on the work of peace. We will defend our freedom. We will bring freedom to others. And we will prevail. May God bless our country and all who defend her. The President of the United States in taking little more than four minutes to say that we are in the early stages of the effort to disarm Iraq. Uh, selected targets are being hit, said the president, to undermine the ability, as you see pictures of Baghdad, to undermine the ability of the Iraqi forces to stop the assault, the broad assault, as the president put it, which is coming, though has not yet begun. Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon. Jamie? I'm sorry, Aaron? I'm sorry. CNN has been told that this was in fact a decapitation strike aimed at killing or at the very least sending a powerful message to Saddam Hussein. This strike, which was uh, employed cruise missiles and F-117 stealth fighters over Baghdad, was targeting a location where it was believed Saddam Hussein and other Iraqi leadership were located. Now, these kind of, this kind of intelligence is always somewhat problematic, and the U.S. military is well aware that uh, this kind of a strike using cruise missiles and uh, uh, precision-guided bombs from the air uh, has a low probability of success in targeting an individual. But nevertheless, apparently there was enough intelligence for the United States to attempt a decapitation strike uh, to take out Saddam Hussein even before the war began. Uh, this is, is not the beginning of the war, according to a U.S. Uh, official uh, telling CNN, but in fact it was a target of opportunity that the U.S. felt it could not pass up. The intelligence would not last long enough for them to wait for the scheduled start of the war. Uh, so, uh, Aaron, very dramatic information here, and of course now we want to know the results of this strike, and at this point we have no idea. And that may take some time to know, but again, uh, as Jamie reported, it appears to be a, 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 an attack or uh, a leadership bunker or a place where perhaps Saddam Hussein was, perhaps he and the government uh, of Iraq were, were hiding out, trying to stay safe, uh, attacked by cruise missiles. The United States government, the United States military has done this sort of thing before with less success. It's a not an easy thing to do, and we won't know for some time if it was successful, maybe a long time. Uh, Nick, what are you hearing in Baghdad, Nick Robertson? Aaron, the anti-aircraft gunfire uh, picking up again at this time. Very interesting that the target of opportunity struck apparently uh, President Saddam Hussein, possibly uh, somewhere he was believed to be. One remembers only a few hours ago when the rumor circulated uh, that Deputy Prime Minister Tariq Aziz might have been killed or defected. Iraq was very swift within half an hour putting Tariq Aziz on international television so that everyone could see, not only in Iraq, but around the world, that this rumor wasn't true. Um, possibly uh, an indication here, President Saddam Hussein may himself seek to disprove any rumor or any indication or any thought amongst his followers that uh, this strike may have been successful. Uh, he may uh, choose to do, as he did in the, uh, the, day, uh, the day the Gulf War started in 1991, then he chose to speak on Iraqi television. That is something we may see later today. Certainly, for now, the anti-aircraft gunfire here is sporadic. It appears to be not coming from the center of the city, perhaps a little bit out of the center. The skies above the city beginning to clear a little, the clouds opening to allow through some blue skies. Still a little hazy, the visibility here, Aaron. We see, um, Nick, and I know you can't, so I'll just tell you what we're seeing in these pictures that we're able now to uh, establish again from Baghdad. There is some traffic, not a lot, but there is some traffic on the street. It does not look to us to be military vehicles, though some of it might be. 
um, but there is still some traffic moving as we approach about 6.30 in the morning in Baghdad. Nick, uh, stay with us uh, for as long as you can hold the phone line. Uh, John King at the White House, the president made all of the points that he has in many respects been making for the last several uh, weeks, if not months. This is not a war against Islam. Aaron, only four minutes from the uh, president, as you know. John. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, Aaron. John. John King, can you hear me? I hear you fine. Um, I was saying the president was making a lot of the points that he has been making for a long time. This is not a war on the Iraqi population, not a war on Islam. It is a war on Saddam Hussein and his regime. And in that, and in only four minutes, as you noted, the president touching on that important political message aimed at the citizens of Iraq and more broadly the Arab street across the Middle East. He said the United States has no ambition in Iraq. It simply wants to free and liberate its people and remove a tyrant from power. The president making no secret that the goal is regime change. Also a political message to the people of the United States, though. Mr. Bush saying this conflict could be longer and more difficult than some predicted and would require a long and sustained effort to build up a new Iraq in the the wake of this war. So Mr. Bush speaking both directly to the Arab citizens of the Middle East, also to the citizens here at home in laying out the early hours of what he promised would be a campaign using decisive force. We are witnessing the early moments of the war in Iraq, a much more controversial war than the president launched in October 2001 against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And in this campaign to remove Saddam Hussein from power, we are seeing the first test of this very controversial Bush administration policy in which this president says he has the right as commander-in-chief of the United States to attack a nation if he perceives it to be a threat against the United States, even if it has not attacked the United States. Again, as you look at Baghdad, it is eerie when you consider that it's clear from the president's words, the president's words, the early stages of the disarmament of Iraq have begun. The war, whether it is the full massive rollout that we all anticipated and were told to expect, or something of a smaller scale, as you look at Baghdad, it is quiet and, to our eye, as calm as calm can be. Now, there may be parts of Baghdad itself where that is not true. Uh, we have a small number of cameras, and they certainly don't cover the large city or the large country. As you've heard many times, a country the size of, of California. Uh, but uh, again, you don't see, um, although we, we thought we heard some loudspeakers uh, uh, coming from the city a while ago, um, you don't see any sense of panic in the city, any sense of movement in the city, or frankly, any sense of war in the city. General Clark, your eye on these matters is far sharper than I. What do you see? Well, you can't see anything in Baghdad right now. It looks like there's some lights on, so they haven't executed a blackout of the city. Um, you, we haven't heard any sirens recently. The shooting has stopped, so that means there's good command and control or some command and control over the air defense, so we haven't taken out all those air defense assets yet. And um, it sounds to me like it was precisely what we uh, were speculating on, Aaron, that they had an opportunity to strike at the leadership, and they had planned to be ready if they had such an opportunity. They had it. They struck. Uh, hopefully it'll have some impact. But um, as has been observed, it's probably not the main effort at this point. But it is underway. Whatever it is, it has started. That much is clear from both the events on the ground in Baghdad and from the words of the President of the United States. In the Kuwaiti desert, literally hundreds of thousands of American soldiers and Marines have been waiting now for some weeks for a moment that is about to unfold. That much is clear. Walt Rogers is one of the many CNN correspondents who is, and you'll hear this term a lot, embedded with these units. He has been with them, lived with them, and will travel with them and report on them. And Walt Rogers joins us now from the desert in Kuwait. Walt? Hello, Aaron. I think what we can say at this point is that the U.S. Army, and particularly the 7th Cavalry, is tugging at the leash to be released. But this, again, as the president said, was a selective strike. The army is still sitting in northern Kuwait. It has not been ordered into southern Iraq yet. That's the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, this unit, the 7th Cavalry, uh, which is the uh, scouting unit, can move very, very quickly. But again, the army remains in Kuwait. It has not been ordered ordered into Iraq. Uh, what the president ordered was a selective air strike. Joining me now is the uh, uh, Apache Troop Commander, Captain Clay Lyle, 
uh, 7th Cavalry. Uh, Captain Lyle, uh, we're sitting here waiting. Do you have any indication uh, what your orders are going to be and when? What happens when you get the order to go? Begin by telling us that. Uh, currently, n none of my orders have changed. Uh, we have been and we remain ready. Uh, the soldiers' morale is high. Uh, we are well trained and equipped. And uh, uh, this is news to me. I know uh, the president will act in our best interest, uh, as well as all my higher commanders. Last night, the uh, CO of this unit, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Farrell, was telling the soldiers to expect to fight. Um, what? How do you see the battle unfolding from your point of view? Uh, we just uh, we've uh, looked at the threat in that country uh, from the, all the different elements that are there have been in place to do with the regime uh, and we just uh, we're prepared to deal with whatever we come up uh, wherever we encounter to try to handle the situation but uh, try to view ourselves liberating the people of Iraq uh, and, and trying to remove that regime uh, not invading Iraq uh, how, not fighting the people of Iraq how powerful a military force is the US Army going to throw at the Iraqis once the order comes to charge I'm sure uh, our superiors and the president will use uh, everything at his disposal to no, but ensure I'm talking our about safety. The army. And T tell us about the army. How much punch does this army have? My uh, my troop, this squadron, uh, the Third Infantry Division, have uh, the best equipment in the world. Uh, we're trained. We've been here in the country, training and acclimatizing uh, for uh, quite a while now. The M1A1 tank and the uh, Bradley Apaches and uh, Kiowa Warrior helicopters. Uh, we're ready and. Uh, we can deal with whatever threat we encounter. And what sort of resistance do you expect once you uh, cross the border? It, it's uh, it's hard to tell how the uh, individual Iraqi soldier, what uh, when he encounters American forces, uh, the decision he'll make. I hope he makes the right decision and uh, surrenders to the uh, nearest American soldier. Captain Clay Lyle, the commander of Apache Troop, U.S. 7th Cavalry, saying still not sure what the Army will face once it crosses the border. Again, the dogs of war have not been unleashed down here yet, but the 7th Cavalry is ready. Aaron? Uh, thank you, Walt. Walt Rogers, and we'll be back to you. Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon. Uh, you're able to continue doing some reporting here, uh, picking up pieces. What do you have? We're we're slowly piecing it together, Aaron. We now know that this uh, strike was carried out by uh, more than uh, uh, a dozen or two dozen cruise missiles fired from ships both in the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. So those cruise missiles came at Baghdad from two different directions. In addition, F-117 stealth fighters, uh, with, uh, which can each carry two satellite-guided bombs, were also involved in the strike, which, sources tell CNN, was in fact a decapitation attempt. That is, a, an attempt to take out Iraqi President Saddam Hussein and some of his leadership at a location where U.S. intelligence indicated he may have been. Now, this kind of a uh, strike from the air uh, aimed at an individual on the ground has a very low probability of success because it's difficult to hit, uh, to kill somebody on the ground. It's also entirely possible somebody could move in the time between the planes take off. Uh, but apparently it was felt that this was a target of opportunity that could not be passed up. Saddam Hussein did not avail himself of the 48-hour window to seek exile in another country. And at that point, the U.S. believed he was fair game. Obviously, if the uh, United States military did take out or could take out Saddam Hussein before any shots were fired, that would greatly decrease the chance of bloodshed, of casualties, and certainly increase the chance the Iraqi military would fold, particularly the Republican Guard. It's always been believed that Saddam Hussein, uh, it, it's ruled by fear, is what's really keeping uh, his military fighting at all. So. Uh, I'm assuming here that the thinking was it was worth a shot. If they had intelligence, they could possibly take him out, they'd go ahead and try. But again, this is a limited strike aimed at a leadership target of opportunity. And at this point, the full-blown war, the so-called shock and awe with thousands of cruise missiles and bombs has not yet taken place and may not take place for another day or so. Aaron? Is that right, that we may be an, a, still a day or more away from this unfolding in the president's terms a broad way? Well, think about it because, first of all, it, you need to find out the, the success of this mission. If it turns out that Saddam Hussein is dead or he doesn't appear anywhere, 
that could completely change how this war uh, would unfold. It could turn it into a peaceful intervention. It could uh, certainly break the back of the, the will of the Iraqi army to fight. So the key point now for the next 24 hours is to figure out what happened. Uh, General Clark, General Wesley Clark, the former Supreme NATO commander, does it resonate forgive me for that word, does it resonate to you at all that having now made this attack, having the President of the United States gone on to indicate that this is on, that we still may be 24, 48 hours or so away from the shock and awe, as Pentagon planners have described it, of this war? Aaron, I think it's entirely possible that that could be the case. Again, of course, none of us have seen the operations plan. We really don't know what's going to happen, but I think it's entirely possible, and I'll tell you why. Because we're in the phase now where we're flying and we've got reconnaissance and we're striking around Baghdad. One of the things we learned in Operation Allied Force in Kosovo was that you have to be over the target. You have to try to elicit the responses from the target. You want his radars on, his communications on. You want to pick up that. So a day or two of juking and fainting and going in and out and putting the pressure on pays psychological dividends it gives more opportunity for reconnaissance on the other hand it could be that this is a pause maybe it's a four-hour pause maybe it's six hours maybe something's already happening somewhere else that we're just not seeing on the television Do they, so, but it, i'm sorry general clark does the united states military have so little f fear of the Iraqi military that they would launch this attack and then allow four hours, eight hours, 24 hours, 48 hours for the other side to marshal its forces? Well, I, I think that uh, that in this case would be a risk you could handle. And, I'll t and, and let me explain that. Because we've got continuous visibility over much of Iraq. We've got scouts forward, we've got special operations forward, we've got satellites, we've got aircraft, we've got moving target indicators off those aircraft. So when the Iraqis start to move their forces, we're going to see them. And um, they're moving from one position where they're vulnerable into another position where they're vulnerable. There's a risk as you delay that he, if he has these chemical weapons and biological weapons and he's got missiles, there is a risk that he would strike our forces in the staging areas. But on the other hand, our forces have apparently moved from their locations. And even though Kuwait looks small on a map, it's big when you compare it to the radius of destruction of something launched from a missile. So we've moved to new locations to reduce our vulnerability, perhaps. So it's not inconceivable that we could wait here. Is it likely that there are units, there are American and British units in the deserts of Kuwait um, who do not yet know what has happened so far tonight? I, I think that is possible. I don't think that uh, the troops down at the platoon and company level would necessarily be told there's a decapitating strike. On the other hand, some of them may be in the headquarters plugged in and watching CNN. We always did uh, watch the television broadcast, CNN included, when we were there at the, in Kosovo and in Albania and so forth, because mm -hmm. it is a source of up-to-the-minute news. So they may have known it that way, and it may be put out on the, on, the, uh, on the command net. But in general, the lower you are, the less you tend to know, and the more you f you're focused on exactly what your mission is ahead. These troops have got a lot on their minds. Uh, General Clark, um, stay with us here as we go. This all began... Um, about an hour ago. It began to us with a report from Nick Robertson, who's on the phone with us from Baghdad. Nick has been in Baghdad reporting for some time, and he reported anti-aircraft fire, uh, which we now know was the beginning of a cruise missile attack, or the defense against a cruise missile attack. Not much of a defense that. Uh, Nick is still on the phone. Nick? Yes, Aaron. Uh, hearing some more anti-aircraft gunfire firing off, not coming from the center of the city, but uh, distinct perhaps coming from just a couple of miles away. Um, as you reported earlier, there is a little bit of traffic on the road. Some of it uh, is military traffic. Uh, they don't look like military vehicles, but they are in fact military vehicles moving around the city. Um, but the, the anti-aircraft gunfire at this time, it, it seems to be sporadic. It seems to fire at a perceived target. It is a target that we can't see or locate, and it's uh, and a target that we cannot hear at this time. Uh, the anti-aircraft gunfire appears to be coming from the 
from many different areas, but difficult to say exactly where, but areas that are, that are several miles away from where we are, Aaron. Okay, Nick, thank you. Um, it says war with Iraq apparently has begun. Uh, the president made it pretty clear that the early stages of the war, what he described as the mission to disarm Iraq, is underway. He described these early efforts as selected military targets to undermine the Iraqis' ability to counter uh, the coalition forces which have massed on the Kuwaiti border and elsewhere at sea and, of course, in the skies. Um, it is, um, again, this all, this, I'm sorry, this all began about an hour ago. I know you guys are trying to talk to me. Go ahead. Got it. Jamie McIntyre, thank you, is at the Pentagon. Jamie. Well, Aaron, you already mentioned this because the president mentioned it. He said targets, selected targets of military importance was the president's words. And we are confirming now that there were more than one target. There was a target in Baghdad, and there was at least another target south of Baghdad. Again, we don't know exactly what the targets were. We don't know if they were presidential palaces or bunkers or what, but they were uh, more than one target that was the subject of this cruise missile and F-117 stealth fighter uh, strike uh, in Baghdad again a leadership target of opportunity, an apparent decapitation attempt to take out the leadership of Iraq before uh, even uh, any of the other shots have been fired in this war. Of course, this is the beginning of hostilities, but the U.S. is going to want to figure out exactly what it accomplished, if anything, before it decides how it's going to proceed with the, uh, with the opening salvo of what was promising to be a very punishing bombing campaign. These uh, flashes that we've seen over Baghdad, as best we have been able to tell as we watch them, have been tracer fire from the ground to the sky. We have, we have not seen from our camera positions, we have not been able to see uh, these cruise missile attacks at all. Um, again, around the country now, there are all sorts of military operations waiting to move in on the borders. Ben Wiedemann is in the northern part of Iraq. Ben is with Kurdish troops. This is part of the complicated ethnic and religious makeup of Iraq that over the weeks that this war plays out, we suspect we'll spend a fair amount, a fair amount of time talking about. Um, probably not the night for it now, but it is the time to go to Ben and see what he can tell us. Ben? Yes, Aaron. Well, by and large, at least in this part of the northern front, it appears to be uh, rather quiet. Right behind me are hills which do have uh, Iraqi army, in, army emplacements. We've seen that uh, the number of Iraqi troops who are there have been increased uh, in recent weeks, but by and large, it's quiet. We have been watching some Iraqi troops. Uh, it's early in the morning here, but they've uh, been wandering uh, between the positions, most of them, in fact, unarmed. And so it's, it's very calm here at the moment. We've noticed uh, that in the last hour or so, actually, the number of Kurdish troops, however, has increased uh, significantly here. Uh, we saw two uh, leadership cars of the Kurdish Democratic Party driving into this town, which is right next to me, uh, the town of Kalak, which has been by and large evacuated by its inhabitants, numbering about uh, 6,000. So very much expectation of something here, but at the moment, and as, as I said, very quiet on this front. Aaron? Ben, thank you very much. Ben Wiedemann, um, CNN correspondents, lots of them uh, are embedded is the term. Technically, Ben wouldn't be embedded, but he's been with the Kurdish military. When we've got correspondents embedded with units around um, around Kuwait, ultimately, and not uh, not too very far along uh, along the road here. They will be clearly be in Iraq and will be hearing their reports um, in many cases in real time as whatever plays out, plays out. As you look at these pictures of Iraq, of Baghdad right now, you know what has happened. You know that a dozen to two dozen cruise missiles have hit a couple of sites, one site in the city. At the same time, Oddly, life has gone on. Um, Iraqi TV has been on the air. Um, Iraqi radio has been on the air. All of 
uh, normal Thursday morning life. I think that's probably a, a bit of a stretch to say normal Thursday morning life has gone on, but in fact life has gone on. Uh, out in the Persian Gulf, the USS Constellation, one of the aircraft carriers that is in play and will ultimately, its planes will ultimately play a role in this. Frank Buckley is embedded with those uh, sailors and those pilots and Frank joins us now to give us a sense of what they know out there and what the mood is out there. Frank? Aaron, uh, I watched the president's comments along with a group of officers in a lounge, uh, and that group of officers including some pilots who might be involved in any strikes against Iraq. They watched uh, quietly, uh, solemnly, as the president made the comments uh, regarding this uh, first beginning phase. Uh, they expressed, as we've heard over and over, sort of a sense of relief uh, since the president announced the deadline uh, against Iraq. Also, you get a sense of this moment in history among the ship's crew uh, during launches that have been taking place uh, from the flight deck of this aircraft carrier in recent hours. And I'm being careful not to say exactly when those launches were, but during recent hours when you go out uh, on the area that's known as Vultures Row overlooking the flight deck, I've seen more people out there during recent hours than I have uh, in my two-plus weeks on this ship. Uh, sailors who are going out with their own video cameras, their own cameras to take pictures of what they believe is a, a moment in history. As far as uh, the actual launches and flight schedule off this carrier, uh, officials, U.S. Navy officials tell us that they are involved in normally scheduled missions, uh, Operation Southern Watch missions, but a sense of what is to come is evident in the hangar bay of this aircraft carrier, Aaron. Uh, row after row of 2,000-pound JDAM bombs uh, lined up in the hangar bay of the USS Constellation. Aaron? Frank, thank you. We know many of you, uh, when we start talking about where troops are, what troops are doing, um, get very nervous, and we do too. Um, the rules that we are operating under, rules that uh, the Pentagon and news organizations around the world have agreed to, is that while our correspondents are embedded, they are in place, they will be free to broadcast uh, or file, they won't be censored, uh, but they do, um, they uh, do remain under the control to some degree of unit commanders uh, as to whether they can file and certainly at no time will we be discussing specifically where they are specifically what they are going after we are very going to be very conservative on this uh, we are not interested in endangering a single life to get uh, a story more quickly. There's no, no, no nothing is served by that. Um, so understand the rules that are being played by, and as you hear these reports, understand that we are extraordinarily aware of uh, the danger American and British forces are in, and extraordinarily careful in how we're going to report whatever it is that's about to play out on the borders of Iraq. Christian Amanpour and Wolf Blitzer will spend um, a considerable amount of time, however long this ultimately goes, whether that is a few weeks or longer in Kuwait, reporting the story from there. Uh, both seasoned war correspondents, as most of you know, certainly, and they join us now from Kuwait, Christian and Wolf. Aaron, there's no doubt that uh, the original game plan was for a day or two of concerted airstrikes before the U.S. ground forces, which are massed in the northern part of Iraq, would move in, the northern part of Kuwait, that is, would move in. So there's no doubt that uh, the, uh, there shouldn't be no surprise that those 100,000-plus U.S. troops, another 30,000 or so British troops in the northern part of Kuwait are not yet moving into southern Iraq. The uh, expectation was always that there would be a massive airstrike at the start of this war. As Jamie McIntyre and others are now reporting, though, there were some targets of opportunity, and as a result, uh, the U.S. began what was uh, an opportunity to try, in the words of U.S. officials, decapitate, decapitate uh, the uh, Iraqi leadership, if you will. Now, this is allowed under the rules that have been established. It was also allowed during the first Persian Gulf War. If you go after what are called command and control areas, and the leadership, including the president of Iraq, happened to be inside those so-called command and control areas, it would not necessarily violate the prohibition that was incorporated by 
President Gerald Ford in 1977 that forbids uh, assassination of foreign leaders. In a military kind of environment, when there is a war, U.S. government lawyers have determined if you go after the leadership, if you try to kill the uh, command and control leadership in the course of a war, that is not necessarily a violation of that rule, barring assassination. Joining well, me here is Christian Amanpour. We've been. I'm sorry, Wolf. Well, the White House. Yeah, go ahead. I, I recall. Uh, a perhaps two, three weeks ago, um, Ari Fleischer, in one of the just normal routine press briefings, was asked about this point because there had been a story out there that the president was considering lifting the prohibition. And Mr. Fleischer made it very clear, very clear, that once war starts, all bets are off. Uh, that, that Saddam Hussein right. is as much uh, a target, a legitimate target, as any other military target. He is a military leader in some sense, the commander-in-chief of his armed forces, and he is fair game. And there's no question uh, from the beginning that the United States uh, would very much uh, like to make sure that Saddam Hussein does not walk out of this in any way, shape, or form. Precisely. That's precisely the point I was trying to make, that uh, this uh, effort to try to kill, if you will, Saddam Hussein and the top leadership of Iraq, if in fact that's what occurred during this, these initial cruise missile strikes, F-117A strikes, at these selected targets in and around Baghdad, that would not, according to U.S. lawyers, government lawyers, be a violation of the executive order that was signed uh, by President Ford way back in 1977. Christiana, if you, as you look at what's going on right now and you've obviously been involved deeply in covering this story as of, as of I always dozen, dozen of years. What goes through your mind? Well, you remember, of course, in the first Gulf War, they did try to get Saddam Hussein. They weren't able to. There was some mis- strikes, as you remember, the Amaria shelter, and that led to quite a lot of controversy. But this is not new. Of course, they were trying to go after the leadership, and of course, they want to get him, and they've made that very clear in this incident. I think what's interesting, and perhaps to review a little of what's gone on today already, we had reports throughout the day that the U.S. and British aircraft have already been in action over areas in the no-flight zone, the southern no-flight zone. We're told they took out about 10 or a dozen uh, artillery pieces that could have threatened U.S. and U.K. forces now in the demilitarized zone north of Kuwait and also that could have threatened Kuwait itself. Also, the Pentagon and CENTCOM in neighboring Qatar have confirmed that 17 Iraqi soldiers uh, surrendered already before a bullet was even fired earlier today. So uh, there's been a lot of psychological warfare. We've heard a lot about that, electronic warfare and uh, other kinds of uh, psychological pressure to try to influence the Iraqi military not to fight and to, to take up non effective positions. A lot of leaflets have been dropped. We talked to a senior British official, uh, rather officer, earlier today who said that there had been about two million dropped uh, over the last uh, 24 hours as well. And now reading some of the wires that are coming out of Baghdad, again, very interesting. According to Reuters correspondence in Baghdad, a U.S. military appeared to have taken over the main frequency of the Iraqi state radio, saying that Saddam Hussein's administration was under attack quote, this is the day we've been waiting for. In addition, they say, as we know, that electricity is still working in the city, but that the state radio has ceased to broadcast after the blast. And minutes later, according again to a Reuters correspondent there, a new announcer broke in on state radio frequency, apparently from the U.S. military, apparently speaking in Arabic, saying the facilities of the Iraqi regime have started to be hit. And if that is the case, that would measure up to what we've been hearing all these weeks and months that there have been uh, concerted efforts to uh, make these messages, to get these messages across by the United States to the people and of course especially the military of Iraq. And Christiane, it's very significant I think also, one sentence, a lot of the sentences the president made were very significant, but one sentence in particular that uh, I want to quote verbatim what the president said. He said, this will not be a campaign of half measures and we'll, we will accept no outcome but victory. That would seem to be a direct uh, response to what happened in 1998 when the then Clinton administration launched cruise missile strikes against selected targets in Iraq after those UN weapons inspectors were pulled out. At the time, there was widespread criticism of Bill Clinton, the then president, and his administration for engaging what his critics called were half measures and not finishing the job. There were two or three days of uh, strikes against Iraqi targets 
in, uh, in uh, Iraq at that time by the Clinton administration. The Bush administration at this point clearly trying to make the point this will not be a campaign of half measures. Our senior White House correspondent, John King, is over at the White House collecting information, as he always does. John? Well, Wolf, we are told this pivotal moment, the first moment seeking this target of opportunity, this leadership target that includes Saddam Hussein, is the culmination of a meeting that ran nearly four hours in the Oval Office. The president was briefed, we were told, by the CIA director, George Tenet, his national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, told by a senior official that meeting broke up at 7.20 p.m. tonight, Washington time, just 40 minutes before the deadline for Saddam Hussein to leave the country. We are told at that meeting, the president was told that U.S. intelligence sources and Pentagon officials were concerned they would lose a target of opportunity if they did not launch this selective strikes, as the president called him tonight. The president made the decision, we are told, at that meeting, again, that broke up at 7.20 p.m., just 40 minutes before the deadline, to go ahead with this limited operation. And to give you a sense of the business-like manner of this White House, the operation, the president gave the orders. He went to have dinner with the First Lady. The operation obviously was underway. Mr. Bush came back and made that statement to the American people. And within moments of finishing that statement, Mr. Bush walked back to the White House residence. We are told he is retiring for the night. Vice President Dick Cheney left. We are told he has gone home for the night. And National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice has left the White House as well. You can be certain that Dr. Rice would have stayed on hand had there been planned more any massive scale strikes that would be critical to this operation. So as the President said, selective operations have begun. Many more to follow. Aaron. John, thank you. Senior White House Correspondent John King. John, I don't know if you feel it um, in quite the same way, but we seem to be in a kind of odd moment where we know something has started, something important has happened, but the full impact of it really has not yet started, and we, we know no more now when it will start than we knew all day long as we, all of us, I suspect in many cases all over the country, speculated on when it would begin. It's, it's like a brief intermission in some terrible but real movie exactly the case that sense here at the white house in a reinforcement of what the president said in his address earlier this week to the american people when he said this war would begin at a time of america's choosing he said america would strike at a time of its choosing this is not the shock and awe that we expected on the first